Romance. Johnny Bloodclot back on the podcast for his 2000th appearance on the show. A.K.A. Jayananda Das. <laughs> That's right, Jayananda Das. Good love, to see you, man. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. We had a great conversation. We talked about his experience doing Joe Rogan's show. We talked about his life as a Hare Krishna monk. We talked about the new documentary he's working on. Uh, 30 to Life, 34 Life, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 to Life with Paul DeGelder and Kip Anderson and his brand new book called The PMA Effect. Awesome episode. What did you think? Yes, how did, it was how did awesome, it man. It was, good. It, was, uh, it was epic, you know. I try to learn something too, pick your brain. Uh, and, uh, no, no, no. It was all him, man. You, I just you, had to get you, out of the uh, way. always have... Uh, Super. All I have to do is wind you up, man. You know, you you know what go. buttons to push. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Can uh, I say peace and plants? I always do want that. Do it. Peace and plants, man. Jai Ananda Das. Jai Ananda Das. In the house, dude. Dude. How we Back here? for round 25. I don't know how many times <laughs> we've done this, but uh, good to see you again, my friend. Absolutely. Delighted to have you uh, back here. We should quickly say, I don't want to linger on this, but we did record a podcast like two weeks ago, and it was epic. It was like over an hour and a half, and I looked over at my uh, digital audio recorder and realized that at some point it had, it had cut out. And we did not. <laughs> That's it's the, the only mechanical failure uh, that I, I actually only want in 400 episodes. It's only happened one other time. So there's a reason. That's special. It's bringing us together another It is. Time, We're back man. again. Uh, and, it, and it tested the, uh, the boundaries of my PMA, my brother, because I definitely got up in my head about it. I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And you're like, dude. It's we a challenge, were just talking man. It's an about obstacle. Actually, we were just talking, and everything that we were talking about manifested that when, you know, things happen, you got to be able to to push through it and see that it's a test and yeah. this and that. And then next thing we know, I look over, you're sweating, you got your glasses <laughs> off, you're like I'm you're having like, a fucking panic matter? attack. What yeah. the fuck? I'm like, are you, I thought it was like, holy shit, what's going on? And then you're like, none of this recorded. Yeah, I know. It was you rough. Know, yeah. And here's the thing, like adaptability is what it's about. It's not about like, oh man, you know, shaming myself because I had a strong reaction because I was emotionally invested in our conversation and excited about the prospect of sharing it and then it goes sideways it goes left the expectation is not met and that doesn't mean that you're not going to be disappointed but what i've noticed is the half-life of that disappointment fading right. much more quickly so i can like sh shrug it off like a little bit easier than perhaps i used to be able to well you know what it is too it's and, and doing this documentary and that I'm doing 30 to life and working with these uh, parolees that have done insane amounts of time is mm -hmm. that you can't keep punishing yourself when things happen and uh you know, it was the same thing. Yeah, well, it's a little embarrassing to compare, like, oh, our conversation didn't record to a guy who's, you know, coming off 25 years well, in prison. Well, you know, the thing <laughs> was, you always have to look ahead and try to make a positive and look to the positive. And immediately when that happened, I was like, yo, chill, it's cool. We're going to go ready to have your anniversary dinner. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, things happen, man. Things happen, It's dude. always... A, it, 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 like we were talking about that even in my races and I've never had a race where it yeah every it, it's been, been a running some. joke yeah between us because I'm like every time you do an Ironman something goes crazy sideways mm -hmm. on you you've never done an Ironman race where you showed up and it just went to plan nope <laughs> what's it's, going on with that it's uh, the test of tests because not only do you have to complete the uh, endurance test it's a mm -hmm. mental test to you know to, things are going to happen and it's like you always have to be resilient resiliency is is a quality that i've had to develop uh in my life to uh push through Get through anything bad man. shit man well speaking of uh things that are happening right now yesterday you were on joe rogan's podcast that was a big moment yes so i wanted to kind of recap it for a minute i mean it was cool i thought you crushed it i thought you rocked it and i thought you guys had um a really amazing conversation that i think goes a long way towards bridging this gap between the vegan plant-based community and other perspectives on diet 
and nutrition. And, you know, I really like the way that Joe opened it up by saying, look, there's a toxic dialogue happening right, right. now, whether you're paleo or carnivore or low carb or whatever it is. We're all in our respective silos. We're shouting at each other on social media, and we're missing the big picture, which is that most people out there uh, are just suffering. They're eating McDonald's. They're not taking care of themselves. They're over-medicated. They're in jobs they hate. And all of that bickering basically just perpetuates a status quo that's in nobody's interest. And the fact that Joe um, had the grace to have someone like yourself on the show who's coming from a different perspective, I think speaks very highly of his character and his genuineness when it comes to really trying to find a better way to communicate. And I think this breakdown in productive dialogue is something, you know, obviously we're not just seeing it in the debates around health and nutrition. It's, it's, you know, infected our political discourse and basically every other kind of productive conversation that we're trying to have is being poisoned right now um, by uh, sectors of and the wolves. population. And that's what we... Yeah, and we're divided. And yeah. you, you said it during the podcast, like, we're supposed to be the United States of America and we're the divided states of America right, right now. It's so fucking toxic and there's so much disrespect and so much shit going back and forth with this social media stuff, like, I just want to sit down and have a conversation about the whole thing and be respectful. Obviously, I don't agree with a lot of the things that he does, but, you know, I have friends that do the same thing, and I don't I don't hate on them, but the fact of the matter is it's bridging a gap, and it was an olive branch that was extended to come on and, and have a conversation. I think, I personally think... It, this shit went epic, man. We, yeah, we that fucking, was good. We went and talked about so much mm -hmm. different shit and had a good time and had laughs. I mean, you know, when he got into the whole, uh, you know, cholesterol <laughs> and saturated fat, I was like, well, you know, who's funding those studies? Like, there were certain things I had to be like. Well, you know, I think you have to pick your battles and, yeah. and, and look at the bigger picture of what are you trying to accomplish in this conversation. Right. Like you could have dug in and gone into the trenches on a specific sort of point that right. he was trying to make. And I think ultimately you making the decision to like, look, let's just make this about inspiration and goodwill. That's what I We did. could quibble about these little things, but I think that would have just gone off the rails and, and, and I think it would have undermined the greater you know impact that you can have by saying – look, this is where I'm coming from, and, and having people leave that experience with perhaps a different perspective on a lifestyle that you've been leading for, you know, what, 30 years at this point? 37. 37 years. 37 going you know on 38. I mean, I mean and, you know, and really shift people's per, per, you know, opinion on, on, on the lifestyle because you're coming from a very unique perspective yeah. on it. I mean, so many people commented that were like, you know, yeah, he, you know, it's just – one con like just you get all the trolls on social and, and a lot of it was coming uh you know this these vegans were like after listening to that shit i don't even know where you stand on hunting that was bullshit you had a chance you got to attacked by vegans yeah oh, i didn't i don't pay attention to any of that no stuff. i don't but it was like I, you know i saw it because it came up and, and i was you know, tagged it. Do I give a well, shit? Well, they're, they're, they're basically perpetuating the very thing that you were trying to speak out exactly. against. Exactly. And you know what? Most of the people were like, that shit was epic. Like, fucking 99% uh, percent of the people that heard the podcast all the way through and... Uh, you know, it was it was uh, it was a, it was a great conversation. Yeah. Man. Well, what was hilarious is it was clear very early on, like. Joe makes this decision to just kind of, you know, throw you a little bone and then like lean back. And you just, you were like a wind up doll. <laughs> which, which one? Well, basically, like you would just go. Like yeah. he, he'd ask you one question and then you'd go for like 25 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he And said, he could have interjected, but he's like, I'm just going to let this guy tell his story. Well, you know, because you things, were on fire. One of the things that I really wanted to get across was the fact that I don't limit myself. He was like, you know, vegan. And I was like, I don't call myself a vegan. And well, let's I, talk about that. I mean, yeah, you, you're like, you look, I'm more of a bhakti yoga guy because right. that's your entry point into all of this. Yeah, because uh, I was like, I don't call myself a vegan. I don't call myself, uh, I, I don't label myself an Ironman. I don't label myself a punk rocker. I don't put 
mundane labels uh, onto my and somebody just asked me that because uh, like before I even went on the podcast I was like I don't call myself a vegan and mm-hmm. they're like why not and I'm like because that limits well Joe was like yeah but you are right yeah I said I practice all the ethics of veganism uh, to the unteenth degree which is I don't use animal products I don't wear animal products I don't support any testing I don't eat any any animal products whatsoever but I'm coming from a more universal approach with everything that I do, which I said I call myself a Hare Krishna before I call myself anything. He's like, what? Like, uh-huh. it was, you know, I kind of threw him sideways on the whole thing because right. he He's expected like t- <laughs> to me to defend my vegan position. And I was like, well, dude, here, check right. this out. He's like, where did where did the Hare, Hare Krishna thing come in? And then you you told like a 40-minute story to, yeah. bring, it, to bring that around. Yeah. And but I'm it was always, good because you had to contextualize that in order for it to make sense. Yeah, otherwise it's like, yo, this dude's weird. He got into that. People don't know really what Hare <laughs> Krishna is about. And well, I, I kind of tried to had to, uh, you know, to to break it down and mm-hmm. say like, yo, it was bad brains, and they got me the job at the health food store, and then the guy there was this famous punk rocker named, who played in this band of Dots, and then he was, you know, I would challenge him every day philosophically, like, and he would defeat me by quoting Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita and like all of this stuff, and giving me this book, Science of Self Realization. That shit was. Once I read that book, and and actually, wait a minute, to correct myself, he did not give me that book. He said to me, Krishna is going to show you that what I'm telling you is the truth. And two days later, I took organic vegan groceries to my mom, and I'm in 74th Street in Jackson Heights, Roosevelt train station, and there's a Hare Krishna there, and that's who gave me the science of Mm self-realization. Two days later... And then I'm like, you're not going to fucking believe this, dude. I go back to the helpful store and he just laughed. He's Did like, he have dude. like the shaved head with the pot, little patch of yeah, hair on the yeah, whole thing? The Sika, what do they call that? Sika. Sika. Yeah, the with Sika the robes and the, and the whole yeah, thing. It's a, it was, he was a monk and, and right. he, he was distributing books in a train station. And the thing was, that's where I learned about service because he goes, I said, well, you should just give me that book. I, I, why should I have to pay for the knowledge? And he goes, it's about you surrendering to the process. And that's why I said, well, I don't have any money. All I have is these groceries. He's like, well, I've been working here all day. How about I, uh, we, we, I take one of those bottles of juice? And I said, yeah, that's a good trade. I'll trade you the bottle of juice for the book. Uh-huh. And then I read that book and I was like, I got to go to the temple, man. Right. That's what brought you in. So... Uh, the Hare Krishna thing is fascinating, and I want to kind of explore this a little bit more deeply. Um, I recently had Nimai Delgado on the podcast. Right. By the time this airs, that will have already aired, but um, everybody knows him as the crazy, you know, fit vegan bodybuilder guy, the guy that, like rocks a physique like nobody's business. It's insane. He's never eaten meat in his whole life, but what I did not know about him was his crazy spiritual story. He grew up with Hare Krishna parents. And he is an adherent to the principles to this. He sort of ventured away, and now he seems like he's kind of back in that world in yeah. an interesting, in an interesting way. Um, and what's compelling about that is he obviously doesn't doesn't you know sort of cut the picture of what you would expect of a person who is uh, of that perspective and faith. And and I think you know from my own personal perspective, when I think of Hare Krishna. I think of, you know, the people, the, the monks ringing the bells and, and, you know, trying to get you to buy the book in the airport or the bus station or walking through the park in some urban center and looking at it like, well, that's weird. That's clearly some kind of weird cult. And that's about all I knew about it. Right. You know, that's, that, that is the be all end all of my education when it comes to Hare Krishna, just some weird fringe, like religious cult. So it walk me through and explain to me. Um, why you found this compelling and and maybe what's you know the truth behind it that resonates with you versus kind of that image that I have in my head right so uh, to break it all down I would reference um, my guru uh, Srila Prabhupada and a film that came out about his life called Your Ever Well Wisher 
And he comes from a sampradaya in India that goes back thousands and thousands of years of unbroken teachers. A sampradaya is it's, like a lineage A disciplic succession, parampara, mm -hmm. the dis disciplic succession. So his uh, spiritual master, his guru, Bhakti Siddhanta, said, you have to go to the West and spread this knowledge. Now, Prabhupada, at 70 years old, he was already in retired life sannyasi. So for him to get on a ship and cross two oceans and have a heart attack, two heart attacks, and come to New York uh, because his guru told him to take the knowledge of the Vedas, whereas all yoga stems from the Veda means knowledge. Mm -hmm. So at 70 years old, he comes to New York, he gets robbed. He's, uh, you know, uh, just his life was about service. So... Uh, you know, down on the Lower East Side, opens up a storefront, all the yippies and the hippies and Allen mm -hmm. Ginsberg and everybody, and, and he starts the printing of his books. So, Bhagavad Gita as it is, Srimad Bhagavatam, all of this. So, um, this is back in, in, in the 60s. And uh, back and he, doing, came to, he came to New York in the 70s, though? So? No, he came to New York, I believe it was 66. Uh -huh. And he passed 60, in like 77. 77, right? yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, where he came to was the neighborhood where I live and grew up, basically, which was uh, a very dangerous uh, area for him to be down there. But that's the work. While all the other gurus were living up on Park Avenue, that's why I think he resonated with a lot of people, and especially with me when I found out about his story, because he came here with $7 and a case of books. Can you imagine at, seven, at 70 years old? Mm -hmm. Seven dollars and a case of books, and the order of his guru, and having faith in that order that his guru told him, "This is already preordained that this is going to happen. This is there's a golden period, you know, whatever the age of Aquarius. Everyone's looking for spiritual knowledge. Just go, and everything will happen." And it did. People started joining. The temples got built, and he, the books the books went out. So when you see people. Uh, in the robes and the shaved head, those are the monks. So their job is to go out there and follow in the footsteps of the Acharya. Acharya means one who leads by example, and that's what Prabhupada did, and distribute those books to help the next person in line. So coming from where I came from, which was a life of violence and a life of crime and a life of drugs and just all the insanity that me and my brothers had to go through and still... Uh, you know, when I first met the devotees in 1980, I actually met them first in Washington, D.C. when I was hanging out as a punk rocker. Mm -hmm. And we used to, like, make fun of them dancing and all the punk rockers, we would just spoof on them dancing around on the street, you know, like punk rockers with the Hare Krishnas. Right. But then somebody tried to get, you know, we would see them all the time and they would be so nice and then some jerk-offs tried to, like, get in their face and, and I stood and I just got up and in the dude's face I was like yo back the fuck off dude don't do not do nothing to these people I'm gonna fucking smash you they're not bothering you fuck off and that was before that was got, before yeah. I got to New York but see that was and when I found out later it's all about in a, in a weird way that was doing some devotional service it was like you know, it it was planting a seed. I'm hearing the mantra. They gave me the food. They like, mm -hmm. and then even with the bad brains, um, when I was meeting them down in D.C., they I was I was in this health food store called Fields of Plenty, and they the guy would go to the temple every day and go get the food, and then bring it back. And I would like steal some of his food. And after working there for like two months. The guy goes, yo, you know, I know you stole my food every day. I was like, what? I did not, man. Because I, you know. Uh -huh. And he's like, yeah, but it's okay. It's spiritual food. You're supposed to steal it. There's no hard and fast rules. So it's everything leading. That had to be the first time anybody had said anything like that to you. No, hell no, because I, I was a little thief. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had to he brought, you, he brought you to the temple for the first time. Yeah. Right? But, uh, well, I went to the temple the first time when I got back to New York. And then uh, the Bad Brains got me a job at the health food store. And then all of that stuff mm -hmm. happened. It just kept happening and happening. And it was like 
then when I read the book and knew understood the philosophy of what it is, Bhakti Yogi, it's about service to other people. It's about helping other people, uh, you know, spreading, you know, the wisdom and stuff like that and renunciation and all this amazing stuff because, you know, it says that, uh, you know, religion without philosophy is fanaticism. And that's what you have today is a lot of fanatics. And then, you know, philosophy without religion or devotion is mental concoction. You need a combination of both. So when I read those books by Prabhupada, the, the Bhagavad Gita as it is, uh, the Ishapanishad, the Bhagavatam, all these little other books, Science of Self-Realization, which was uh, snippets of his lectures to people on certain topics, I was like, you know... Uh, the, and the main chapter that hit me was like spiritual solutions to material problems. Because everyone's trying to fix a material problem with another material answer. It don't work. What really starts healing people, and I needed healing because everything that I had gone through, lockup and the drugs and everything else, I needed to do some deep healing. Mm. And punk rock wasn't doing it. Nothing was doing it. It's only when I came in contact with bad brains and then that led me to the health food store and then I started going to yoga and then I started going to the temple and everything and reading the books and applying it because you know it's not just about being armchair philosophers that's one of the things Prabhupada said was that you don't just read this book and then okay I have this knowledge and I'm above you and I feel superior to you it's not about that it's about taking that knowledge and applying it to your life not being an armchair philosopher and staying humble Humility. You should always think of yourself lower than the straw in the street, devoid of all sense of false prestige, and always ready to offer respects and service to others. That's the mood that you're trying to cultivate as a devotee. And it just resonated so much with me because you would go to the temple, they would just make you feel so special. They would serve you hand and foot and sit down with you and, and talk philosophy. And I came at it very challenging. I was trying to defeat it because I thought I was Mr. Philosopher because I read Gurdjieff, Krishnamurti, all these books. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't defeat it. What's interesting to me is is your openness and receptivity to this, like the fact that you have this thirst for knowledge, this thirst for growth and expansion. And, you know, I've heard you talk about, you know, kind of the, you know, the process that led you to that, like meeting the bad brains and the impact that HR had on you and, you know, changing your relationship with food and all of these little kind of dominoes. But I'm not sure I totally understand what it was that actually catalyzed this shift from you know, sort of, you know, street cretin type character to somebody who really like wanted to improve their life, their life, you know, right. like that, that thirst, like it's one thing to go, okay, I know I need to get my shit together and kind of begrudgingly drag yourself through some process of like, you know, uh, you know, cleaning house, but that's very different from, you know, a spiritual awakening where you're like, let me read that book. I can't wait to go see what Krishnamurti has to say. Like, where did that enthusiasm come from? Because that, that's self-generated. Um, I think it came from the fact that I started seeing how it was making me feel to meditate and making me feel how to do when I was doing yoga. And then how I felt when I went to the temple and chanted and, and got up and chanted Japa meditation, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra on beads. It wasn't anything that had to do with something I can explain mentally. It was going beyond the mind, beyond, you know, the spiritual uh, education and spiritual knowledge is something you have to live and experience. And that's what, and I tell this story in the new book I wrote and Chris Garver, the tattoo artist, his he he told this story. He said, "Oh yeah, his mother and, and father uh, went to Korea, and his mother was involved with these Buddhists that meditated. And they, you know, his father's like an old school type dude, mm -hmm. and uh, took his father there, and uh, they tried to get the father to meditate. And Chris Garver's father said, "Why should I meditate?" And the monk said, "Try it for thirty days." 
and see how you feel after 30 days. And he did. And he st- and I just had dinner with Chris the other night. His father's still meditating. So I use the analogy all the time that it's not enough uh, to really taste the nectar and, 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 you know, that's inside the jar. You have to open the jar. It's not something that you can continuously mentally speculate about. Mm-hmm. You have to actually apply yourself to the science, the formula, and then get the result. And the result that I got to see uh, through spiritual practice was what's, it was freeing me from my anxiety, which, you know, the material world is full of that. I was AWOL. I had fucking, I was hunted as a fugitive. Right. I had people looking for me. So it was all this stuff going on and still doing the drugs and still doing whatever. And it was how I felt how meditation and practice and getting up early in the morning and 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 and, and going and doing service and all this stuff, it's how it made me feel and freed me from all of those demons uh, of my past. So if I'm going to say, you know, how did the process work? It was because I did the work. Right, you did the work. The practice thing is <clears throat> such a obvious but but really underappreciated and overlooked aspect of this whole thing. I mean, you know, you're look, as somebody who travels all the time, you're in airports. What do you see when you walk into the airport bookstore? It's right, just like 8,000 self-help books, right? Yeah. Every month, like, you know, 20 more new self-help yep. books. And, like, if these worked, then there would be no need for more self-help books. And I think what happens is, and I'm not besmirching self-help books. They're well-intentioned, and I'm sure most of them have good information in them. But I think what happens is people are in pain. They reach out to these books. They read them, and they can intellectually understand what they're saying. But there's a gap between that and actually putting whatever wisdom is packed into whatever book into uh, a practice that is um, replicable and sustainable and daily. Right. Well, that's one of the things that I say in the new book that I wrote, uh, The PMA Effect. One of the first things I say is you have to agree with me right now to do the things daily that are listed in the book. It's not enough to just understand them and grasp them intellectually. You have to actually do the work and apply yourself for the change to work. For I just know what I just tried to put in the book what worked for me. And what worked for me was taking action. When I got into this, I was like, I got I wanna live as a monk. I wanna live this because I started getting nobody can sustain life without pleasure. It's you're either going to look for pleasure in the material world, which ultimately because most pleasure is in the mode of passion, so it's pleasure in the beginning and misery in the end. Only pleasure in the mode of goodness is pleasure in the, be- in the beginning and the end, and then beyond that is spiritual pleasure. So in order to really experience that, you get those little tastes. It's called rasa, which is taste. Yeah, it's going to be there, and you're going to get that taste, but in or- what I saw was how it made me feel and then I'm like I want to do this more how do I do this how do I I said right away how do I I want to become a monk I want to become a monk and I want to live this every day and uh reap the the uh, effects uh in my life of of what this process could do and I would see the other devotees and be like man these people are so happy and I think that's the greatest thing that everyone sees Hare Krishna is dancing and they're so ecstatic and they're like, oh, they're fucking brainwashed because right. everybody that's walking around. I definitely s- had that thought. If you look at people's, they say the face is an index of the mind. So if you look around and you look at people on the street, nobody's fucking happy. And here's these people, they have nothing and they're dancing around and they're happy and joyous. And it's because, yo, they've devoted their life to this path and and there's so much power in that mantra that it just it brings happiness and and I know that from uh experience because I would do my 2 hours of japa meditation I would go and and do the congregational chanting with the drums and everything and how it 
made me feel was something I never experienced in the material world before. That's mm-hmm. why I took to the process. It was a feeling that I experienced. It wasn't, you know, mental, mental, uh, you know, intellectual understanding something intellectually or mentally does not sustain. That's why people read self-help books and they have the knowledge, but then you talk to them six months later, they go in and do something Mm -hmm. else. I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to be like, all right, I'm going to take this up. Prabhupada said, do this and you'll see the results that come. And that's what I did. And that's why I took to it because little by little, the path was leading to me completely surrendering and becoming a brahmachari, a celibate monk, which I did for two years. Right, which I want to talk about. Do yeah. you have your japa with you right now? Damn in my it's bag. It's in your bag. But yeah. you take that everywhere you go. Everywhere. And what's the, what's the daily meditation process look like? Uh, I try to get as many rounds as I can. It, there's 108 beads on mm-hmm. the So you chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, uh-huh. Ram, 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 Hare Hare on each bead. And then... Uh, you do it around the Java Mala, it's 108, and then you're supposed to do that 16 rounds. Do I do that every day? Not every day I can. When I'm on the road, traveling with the band, I say my mantras every day because we have long drives or whatever. And I have the Nishringa Kavacham playing, which is the ultimate uh, prayer for protection. But there's so much craziness going on in the world, man. That's like my coat of armor that when I chant, uh, it takes you out of the modes of material nature. The three modes are are ignorance, passion, and goodness. And it's a spiritual sound vibration, so it puts you in touch with the spiritual connection and the spiritual energy. And uh, it just... It's not something you can really explain. I try to tell people. It's experiential. It's, yeah, that's yeah. what it is. I say, yo, get some beads and I'll show you the mantra and, and, and chant it yourself. And uh, I know the 108 has significance in Hindu culture. I just forget. What it, do, you, do you know why it's 108? Uh, I'm not I, like I don't know. Yeah, it's just I, yeah, I Vedic I, I astrology. Point, wise, I think it's it a Vedic was, thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a Vedic it astrology. Was, uh, thing. It's an auspicious number. Right. You know, Krishna, um, it's a bunch of different reasons, which I can't put my... Right. <laughs> but yeah. on the on the protective armor thing, uh, you had this crazy story, right? When you were in it, you were you were traveling with the band in a van. You guys got in an accident, like the van rolled yeah, down Yeah, it was crazy because, like, you know, we were on tour, and it was in the 90s, and, um, you know, the ultimate test is they say, yo, will you take, will you chant at the time of death? That's the ultimate thing. Everyone who's born, death is certain. So death is the big test. We have little exams during our life, but then when death comes, can you focus and meditate at the time of death and remember Krishna and chant the holy name? So we were like playing up. It was the winter time, and we played in um, Vermont, and we were driving home through the mountains. And I told the dude, I said, "Look, man, stay on the highway, man." And you know, I know that he smoked fucking hash too. And I was like, "Don't smoke." And stay on the fucking highway because... I on, like, black ice in yeah, Vermont in the middle it was, of the night. Yeah, it, like was, it was fucking... It, was, it started to snow and get bad, and I'm like, dude... And I'm sleeping in the front chair, and I'm sitting in the front passenger seat of the van. And uh, I wake up to hearing, oh, my God, we're going off the cliff. That's what I woke up to in the middle of the night. And then the van just started... The van was just... Fl- just went off the road. We hit black ice. The guy was smoking fucking hash, right. and he went on a side road to save 30 minutes of time or whatever he thought he was saving, and we went off the road, and the van just flipped and bounced and flipped and bounced, and the whole time, I was just chanting Hare Krishna at the top of my lungs. Everybody else was screaming, and I just was like... You know, I just chanted as loud as I could. So at that point, it's like a, it's so deeply ingrained in you as like yeah. the go-to thing for dealing with stress. Well, you know, I've talked to a lot of people and found that this to be true. If you talk to a lot of people who have near-death experience, the mind, it's so painful at the time of death that the mind is racing to find what it felt more comfortable, the most comfortable with in its life. For some people, that's going to be family or, you know, greedy people, it's their bank account. Oh my God, I'm losing everything. Or So if you practice spiritually every single day at the time of death, what are you going to take shelter of? I took shelter of Krishna and I was chanting and uh, 
it was just crazy, man, because like it, the one dude got thrown out of the back window and was laying on the highway uh, when we because the van first flipped. He was going so fast. He was the, the cops said he was doing eighty miles an hour. So when the van first flipped, it like one dude got thrown or right when we started going over and flipped the first time he got thrown out the back window like all the gear was in the van yeah. so it was on top of everybody and my face was all bloody the bolts in the front seat snapped and like slammed my face off the fucking windshield i was cut up i ran back up onto the road and it was like kind of like a bad comedy because just as I got to the top of the road, the salt truck went by. And I'm oh, like, no. you motherfucker, man. <laughs> and then I can see that there was a construction uh, night crew down on the road, like probably a three quarters of a mile down the road. It was all lit up. So I lucky. ran down there to tell them. But the interesting thing was uh, as I got to the top of the road and I walked uh, – probably be 20 feet had we gone off that road 20 feet later the drop was over 300 feet we would have fucking died and i was like yo and i was just chanting and thankful and i ran all the way down there and fucking said hey man we got in an accident we went off the fucking road people are hurt and they called the uh, cops How hurt were people oh they have broken yeah. bones and shit like that like but uh and you yeah. were fine. Yeah, man. I had cuts on my fa forehead and shit and whatever the fuck. And my nose got fucked up. But compared to what the fuck I could have happened. Mm -hmm. But I really feel, uh, you know, for whatever reason, that was just. And I've been tested like that certain times where shit, crazy shit's happened. And like all of a sudden out of nowhere. Because death can come at any moment. And it's like you hope that right. you have enough preparation time to say you know say your mantras and and, and take shelter of, of what you mm -hmm. got to take shelter of. but it's a test and that's why i try to chant every day and 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 uh you know trying to trying to live a positive life every day because uh i think we attract the energy that we put out into the world too like you know and even then I was like having parties and fucking making pot brownies and being a fucking jerk. And I kind of think that that was like, hey, man, slap. Right. I saved you from 20 <laughs> feet of dying. Yeah. You would have went off a cliff, but wake the fuck up, man. Human life is very valuable and you're pissing it away. And the thing is, when you do things in knowledge of what you're supposed to be doing as opposed to not knowing any better, the karmic reaction of that is much more severe mm -hmm. you know so i i i took that as a as a as a as a blessing as uh, a calling as a as a call to action to yeah. take it to the next level absolutely and and how long were you in this before you became a monk and how, and you were a monk for like two years right yeah and how much of that was in hawaii well it first started out in puerto rico and when i got to puerto rico it, it, like i was doing the raw food thing you know i was uh I see i'm just yeah, yeah like it, if i look if i glance at the recorder it's just because i'm neurotic right. that it's right. not recording yeah. i'm listening to you though Keep so going, dude. no i know but uh <laughs> it what was really weird was at but when i joined the temple see i first got into the whole thing i went full bore raw foods i met victoria's Kovinsky. I like met the people from Hippocrates Health Center. Mm -hmm. uh, this dude I knew, Kevin, had a raw food restaurant. So I got in. I was completely raw, organic, organic vegan. So when I went, my friend Vinny that talked to me, the drummer from the Dots and now the Unsane, he told me he lived in Puerto Rico in the temple. You're in the fucking mountains and it's fucking beautiful. You look across the valley. You're in Garabo and then El Junque is right there. It's like so magical and mystical. I was like, I want to join that temple. He's like, just go down, man. They'll accept you in. So I didn't call ahead, nothing. And you showed up. I showed up with. We each had three twenty-five pound how bags. How did you get to Puerto Rico when you're kind of on the lam? Dude, right? they After didn't going check I, They didn't check ID. They you did. were able to get on planes without fucking <laughs> shit back in the day. I traveled all over the goddamn place. Puerto Rico is part of the United States, so I didn't even... Yeah. I had, like, a fake ID, so, like... You don't need a passport to go You don't there, need really. shit to go to Puerto Rico. And I flew down, and I had three 25-pound bags of sprouting seeds, and this other guy, Tomas, from the punk rock scene, he had 20... Because he was 
through, on this journey with me. We went down there together. And he had bags of sprouting seeds. We showed up to the temple with no possessions other than sprouting seeds. They're like, what the fuck is this? I was like, yo, those are sprouting seeds. And right away from the, like, the vibe that I realized something's fucking going on here. Something's, they're like, well, I doubt you're even going to get to use those. Like, and then it was just this weird vibe. And uh, I just remember like, the first, so they said, okay, here, you sleep in this, uh, you know, you sleep in this, in the, the dorms and shit. And it was up in, up near the rainforest. So, like, the first night, we fucking got, like, I was like, yo, is there any more mosquito nets? They're mm-hmm. like, nah, no, we don't have any extra mosquito nets. So I had, like, fucking, you know, 300 mosquito bites. And then at 4 o'clock in the morning, I hear animals screaming and it turns out there's a pig slaughterhouse across the road and they're killing the fucking animals. I'm like, so the dream and this tropical fantasy of being in this beautiful temple in the rainforest and everything started becoming a fucking nightmare. And I'm like, whoa, man, this is... And I just wanted to surrender and be a devotee. And then the temple president, this guy, Vakresh, total fucking criminal, uh calls me into the office and I'm thinking he's going to welcome me and me and my friend sit down and he's like, who the hell told you to come to this temple? I'm like, what? He's like, who told you to come to this temple? I said, well, my friend lived here, Vinny, and you know, he said it's a, it's a great temple. I just wanted to surrender. He's like, bullshit. I'm going to find out what you're doing here and I'm going to get to the bottom of this and then I'm going to throw you the fuck out. And I'm like, Dude, how are you coming at me like that? I'm, 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 you know, I'm trying to be a devotee. I'm trying to surrender. He's like, what's with all those fucking seeds you got? Like, he's cursing at me. Very aggressive. He thought they were drugs? No, he just was like, that's bullshit. Nobody wants that shit. And, you know, this and that. And then, so the first morning, they always give a class on the Bhagavatam. And his whole class, he's sitting on an elevated seat looking at us. And he's like, if you don't like it here, you get the hell out on that road. And you just, we're not even giving you a ride back to the air. It started feeling like some Jim Jones type shit. Right. Like, what the fuck did we step into over here? And then uh, I'm like, yo, I'm a raw foodist. Like, you know, can we get some fruit and vegetables? And he's like, we have no fruit and veg. I'm like, this is a tropical <laughs> island. He's Puerto like, Rico. he's like, throw more chilies into the milk, you know, fucking uh-huh. type, you know, stuff. But basically, it's it's you know, interject imbalanced human into you know a spiritual organization and like light a match. And and then uh, we just he he made us work. All day long in the hot sun, no hats, no nothing on a on a cliff. Come on, dude, where's your gratitude? Removing tree stumps with an axe. I was like, yo, there's a there's a bull. He's like, you're not using the bull. This is building character. Get out there and, you know, we had to chop around uh, the whole thing and then pull the tree stumps out on this hill, and it was just. After like three days, we were fried. I was like, yo, let's just get the fuck out of here. And that's, and that's what we did. And then it turned out he was raping women in the temple. He was, he was fucking smuggling drugs. He was doing all this crazy shit. He was like a fucking a total gangster. Live, you know, and that's the same guy. He was the vice president of the Brooklyn Temple. And later on, asked me to sell, sell drugs for him and do all this crazy shit. And Is that I'm, the guy who threatened you? Yeah. You're, yeah. So what happened was I had left the temple. Uh, I, I ended up joining in Hawaii, and then I came back uh, after a year in Hawaii. I came to New York. And did you do the whole thing with the, the crazy hair and the whole Yeah, the I whole shaved bit my like head. The... I wore the robes. I went uh-huh. out and chanted. I do went you have out... pictures of you from that time? Uh, nah, man. I haven't seen any you know, of you that, yeah, like... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's some somewhere, but yeah. I don't have any. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and then I, I, I left Hawaii and I came to New York. How, but how long were you in Hawaii? A year. Yeah, and that was and that I, was where it clicked in, and that's when you started do, also doing martial arts, and it was kind of yeah. like this Karate Kid. Well, experience. it was it was. Uh, they had me first on a big island up on the farm and stuff like that, and this one devotee practiced martial arts, and then and then we we came back to the to the. Uh, 
a Wahoo temple, and he would train, uh, you know, train every day. So we would uh, go, I would get up at 2 o'clock every morning, chant all my rounds two hours before Mangal Arti, which is the, it's the morning ceremony. And then I would do that, I would go to class, and then before breakfast, I would train, run or swim or do kathas or whatever and then uh, eat breakfast and then go out to Kalakawa Avenue and distribute books and do whatever. So that lasted about a year. And I started noticing now in retrospect that weird shit was going on out there too. It was like you didn't know about it, but then when you heard about it, you're like, oh shit, that's what the fuck was going on there. And this whole and, institution ultimately kind of collapses upon itself, right? This like this well, this sort of poisoning of the you know the ideas of Prabhupada and the kind of fundamental. Well, Prabhupada never appointed any of them to become. They took it upon themselves to be his successor when he left the planet in seventy seven. So I went back to New York, and that's when I did. Uh, I, I was the biggest, one of the biggest. Hustler collectors in the entire movement. <laughs> yeah, they I had think you me told me some stories about doing, that before. Doing huh? stickers at concerts right. and fucking just crazy shit, dude. San- wheelchair Santa and fucking just, you know, crazy stuff to make insane amounts of money. Like I was collecting like $3,000, $4,000 a week and turning it over. And then I started hearing that they're stealing the money and all this shit's going on. And Prabhupada never appointed any of them to be guru they did it themselves and you just started hearing all these nightmares these kids were getting raped and all of this shit was going on and i'm like once you know i heard about the kids in in the school getting raped that's when i was like yo i'm fucking i'm 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 going against these people now and i let i left the temple to do music and stuff whatever like that but i never lost faith i kept going to the temple so then one of the weekends I was going back to the temple for the Sunday feast, that guy, Vakresh, comes up to me and he's like, we get large amounts of marijuana and cocaine donated. Do you know where I could get uh, rid of it and, and, and we can give the money to the temple? I said, dude, you're asking me to sell fucking oh drugs? God. He's like, yeah, well, you know, the person doesn't want to give money. Like, they, they have... Uh, it becomes like a mob thing. Yeah, so that's what he was doing. And he was stealing money. Like, he, he, did, he had all these businesses, and he was just keeping the money and driving sports cars and selling guns and doing steroids. He was like steroids. an African-American fucking thug, dude. That's what, that's what the fuck he was. And then I told this woman, I was like... I, I said, yo, uh, you know, Vakresh asked me to fucking sell drugs for him. She's like, what? And uh, sh- and I said, yeah, he fucking said, you know, do I know where to get rid of pounds and fucking kilos of cocaine and shit? And I was like, because he knew I was street, you know. He knew I'm from the fucking streets and uh, I did know where to get rid of it. But I never, I always kept my material life. And I kept the temple a sanctuary i never brought any bullshit into the temple when i had material desires to have a girlfriend or do whatever i left i I was like yo i can't this is my sanctuary i'm never going to pollute this sanctuary if i want to smoke weed or i want to be with girls or do whatever i'm not going to do it in here and fake the funk and be fake and be a hypocrite i left these guys did it in the temple Mm -hmm. and did whatever the fuck they wanted and and is that still going on, or did it just? Uh, it's did not. The whole it thing got exposed. Just, well, let me let me not get ahead yeah. of that, and then I get to what the All fuck's right. going on now. Uh, so what happened was I came back to the Sunday feast. Unbeknownst to me, she went and told everybody that Yo Vakresh is selling drugs. So he comes up to me in the Sunday feast. He's like, I should beat your fucking ass. This is how he's talking to me. I said, what? He's like, yo, you fucking told everybody the conversation we had? I should fuck you up. And I was like, yo, you're selling drugs. I said, let me tell you something, bro. And I was only like, what, 22, whatever the fuck, younger. He's a grown ass man taking steroids. I know he got guns and everything else. And I just said, bro, I ain't like these other dudes. If you put your fucking hands on me, you better watch your back for the rest of your life because I'm going to put a baseball bat across your fucking skull. I'm not playing. You ain't doing shit to me. So he let it die out. And then 
like months down the road, it was like four or five months later, he goes, uh, because I had started doing press in the magazines and saying like, yo, these people are fucked up. Mm -hmm. And I started exposing. And I lost every single friend of mine that was a Hare Krishna turned against me. How could you do this? You're destroying. I'm like, I'm not destroying nothing. I'm putting the truth out there so people don't get fucking hustled by these charlatans in the garb of devotees. And Prabhupada said, demons will come to this movement dressed as devotees to destroy the movement from within. And that's who these exactly fucking people were. That's what they were doing. So everybody turned against me and called me a fucking demon. And I, I, I went against Ramapad, who now turned out he tried to s sucker and steal the temple for $58 million dollars. And they kicked them out, but they what they were calling me demon and all this shit for speaking the truth, and they uh, they ostracized me from the whole community. Nobody would talk to me, but I, I knew what I had to do was right, and I've done that my whole life. I don't care if you are against me; I will stand in the face of a thousand motherfuckers and speak the truth. That's what I do. So then, months he waits by, and all I was doing all this press and exposing them. And I go to the temple, and he's like, "Oh, you know, hey, uh, you know, I got, we, I, I got these condominiums in, in Virginia, and uh, you know, we need some work oh, done. Uh, I'll pay you a hundred dollars a day. Come down there for a couple of weeks and do work on the condos with me." And I was like, "Really? Oh, man." He's like, "Yeah, everything's cool. I understand. You know, just, you know, pretend that everything was cool." So I told my friend Googie, uh, the drummer from the Misfits, who was also coming around the temple. I said, yo, he just invited me down to work on the condominiums. He goes, bro, they're going to fucking frag you. If you go down there, you're not coming back. They're going to fucking kill you. These guys don't fucking play. They killed Sulochan. They killed these other devotees that spoke out against them. They're going to fucking whack you, dude. You're in the press saying all this shit, exposing them. And I was like, he goes, bro, don't go. You're going to get, you're not coming back if you go. And I didn't go. Whoa. And, uh, and then it just kept continuing and continuing. I kept... And my friends were these kids that, were, that got raped in the fucking schools. They protected them. They covered it up. And, and I just kept speaking out against them. And, and even... So now it became this whole big thing in America. So now they hustle and they use the temples as... You know, and this is what's gone on in Brooklyn. The guy just tried to fucking sell the temple for like... And, and I have connections mm -hmm. everywhere. I know people everywhere. A, a big-ass real estate person three years ago goes, Hey, man, ain't this th the temple? And he does big, huge real estate development deals. And he goes, uh, Isn't this the temple you lived in, 305 Skimmer Hall Street? It's on the market for, four, for fucking $58 million, the building. I'm like, what? They, they're trying to sell the temple. We're, we're, they kicked all the devotees out, and then this one, these corrupt dudes at the top, Ramapad and all these guys were trying to sell the temple underneath the devotees' nose. And, and I started telling people, and then it came out that it's true. And they just, now the devotees all stopped it. Because don't get me wrong, 95% of the devotees... It's the hierarchy who put themselves. They created a pyramid scheme where they're the enjoyers and every the underlings underneath them. Uh, you know it, that's that's exactly what right. It is. So the organization still exists. They're still yeah. Up so to now they do their fuckery. shit in India. Mm -hmm. Like I've been told, if you go to India, we're gonna have you killed and all this shit. So did you have any further run-ins with that dude who? Tried yeah, to send I just you down saw to, him. Uh, well, still he around. just got out of prison because they caught him with <laughs> drugs and guns. All right. No, but here's the thing. I saw him maybe, I don't know, I think it was five or six years ago. And he started trying to spread rumors about me to, to fucking, and I was like, I was like, yo, what the fuck are you talking all this shit? He's like, I didn't say that. And I was like, yo, I was a kid when you threatened me. I said, let's walk out of this park right now. I'm challenging you. Let's go. I know right where we could go and I will fucking beat your ass. He's like, I don't want any problems with you. <laughs> All right, man. Anyway. But here's the thing. Like, you've been able to maintain your... Uh, Krishna consciousness. Your connection with, the, the, with, you know, what for you is the truth of the, the, truth of the you know, the wisdom of 
the Bhagavad Gita yeah. and the Vedas and like this information that was so impactful for you at that time. Exactly, and, because I knew it was still the truth no matter what. I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. I knew that there was there's this corruption going on, but I knew that what Prabhupada came to teach was the truth, the absolute truth, and how he lived his life. And that's the example that I saw. Service to others, renunciation, no bank account with millions of dollars in it like these other dudes. Everything, they went against everything what Prabhupada taught. But that doesn't mean that what Prabhupada taught is not the truth. So I had that. Mm -hmm. And I held on to that tightly. And yeah. now all the other devotees are coming around and being like, yo, man... You fucking was spot on with everything, man. Like, you know. Eh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, I mean, it's an amazing, you know, history lesson on sowing the seeds of destruction of your own spiritual religious organization. Yeah. And, you know, it's not the first time that's happened. It won't be the last. And, you know, it's part and parcel of, of you know, human sickness. You know, and I think it's it speaks to um, – it's, it's so ironic because – it's an organization of elevated consciousness, and yet, you know, here, here we, you're, 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 you're butting up against, you know, the lowest vibration you can imagine in the material you know? world. The most, and that's the the tragic thing about humanity. And I think when you kind of, pro, you sort of project out or broaden that aperture, and look at, you know, what we're seeing right now. Are we still in the age of quarrel? Hell the yeah, age of quarrel. But we're, uh, we're, it is we're, a, it's a. Well, let me just finish this okay. thought. It's, it's we're not going to solve our problems through the next election cycle or, you know, adopting the most optimal diet or, or whatever it is. We are in a crisis of consciousness, right? And the solution lies in elevating our awareness and our, and expanding our conscious awareness of what is happening on an individual level, on a systemic level across the board, right? So you can adopt, you know, the ultimate diet, whatever that may be for you. But if you're fucking crazy and you're an asshole and, you know, you hate your spouse and, you know, you're unproductive at your job that sucks or whatever, like you're not a healthy person. And perhaps there's a lesson in elevating that awareness. Right. So I think that's really, you know, for me, when I speak to you, like that's the heart of of the power in your life experience and perspective. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we are in the age of quarrel, but there is a golden period for 10,000 years within the age of quarrel. They, they, Kali Yuga lasts uh, 437,000 years. We're only 5,000 years into it, but we're 500 years into the golden period of awareness and consciousness, and we're just starting it. And what and I this is from the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, they, well, Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam, mm. the spotless Purana. Uh, and really, uh, I always try to see the glass as half full and be positive. And I'm seeing so much awareness and consciousness of people that I would have never thought 20 years ago would be getting into meditation and plant-based diet and all this great, amazing stuff spirituality their own path whatever it is because it's not dogmatic my path ain't right for the next person i'm fully aware of that but i see a lot of growth that's happening in the world and that's really the only thing that's going to fix what the fuck is going on no no political agenda no food diet no nothing is going to fix what's going on it's it's going to come from each individual's like so you you're, said, op you're optimistic. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. I have to be uh, and, and, and remain optimistic and work to educate the people because that's the whole problem is the lack of access to knowledge and education because there's so much Maya illusion being, being broadcasted to people. You know, just like Rage Against the Machine, one of my favorite bands, it's like, what does the billboard say? Come and play, come and play. Forget about the, the movement. And the movement to me is the movement of the revolution of consciousness. So there's so many distractions in life, but I see those as uh, jewels on the head of the serpent. Mm -hmm. You may be attracted to the razzle-dazzle, but when you get close to that, it's the bite of death, man. Yeah, well, I think new media platforms like podcasting and you know there's so much amazing information that's now available it you know there's a, there's there's too much information in general we're being bombarded with 
<clears throat> so much content that it's impossible to stay on top of, of everything. And I think you have to be more discerning about what you let into your consciousness and your awareness. And, yeah. and perhaps most people aren't. But a lot of this information is free. You know, it's like podcasts are free. You know, it's anybody can dial thing. this up. I, well, I guess you have to have a device, right, to listen to it. So there's that. Um, <clears throat> but I think we're in an interesting place where we do have the the ability to cross this socioeconomic divide that um, I think has been problematic in recent years that that has been promoting this message that these ideas, whether it's wellness, diet, nutrition, plant-based or otherwise, uh, you know, meditation, mindfulness, that these are luxuries of, of the well heel. These are elitist ideals. That's great if you got a six-figure income you know, or whatever, but I'm just trying to get through the day, right? I'm working two jobs, all of this sort of thing. And, and I think what's so powerful about your example and, and how you live your life and the way that you're of service is that for you, it's all about <clears throat> blowing up that idea and making these um, ideas, practices, habits um, accessible to the people who need it the most. Yeah. I mean, um, that's my story in a nutshell, too. You know, I didn't have the luxury of all this stuff. And I just see that this whole, even the plant based and vegan movement, it's like, you know, you go to these, it's like, the people that really need it the most, they can't afford $30, $25 to go into a veg fest and, you know, all this food and all the access to this stuff and, and go. Well, even if they could, they probably wouldn't. It's not where they're going. Well, you know, the whole thing is is it, it comes down to the value system that uh, they've been subjected to their whole life, what's important. And, I mean, I'm uh, I'm doing this documentary now, and it's it's really about that whole thing of... Uh, when people grow up in their surroundings and circumstances, you can't remove their surroundings, just like what my surroundings were that led me to get incarcerated and led me to be a drug addict. And, let, you know, it's, it's not um, passing the buck and, and not taking responsibility for my own actions because I do, but it's just, you know... The, the surroundings and sets of circumstances that I've encountered with these individuals that I'm working with in this documentary, which we, you know, it, it, we can get into it. it it's, um, it's unfucking believable what's happened to these people. So you could say, hey, this guy did such and such crime and got away for 20 years, and it's nice to categorize that person and put him on a shelf. But let's open that fucking book up and let's see what really went down. Oh, wow. He was abused and molested as a child. His mother turned her back on him and didn't care. The father died. They put him in a foster home. He was mm -hmm. more abused. Uh, he became very angry. Anybody trying to do anything to him. Well, if you do a forensic analysis on, on every person <clears throat> who becomes a violent offender, you're going to be able to identify you know, the, all the steps, all the things that occurred, all the abuse suffered etc that led to creating that that individual that human being and we have a penal system that is becoming more and more privatized with built-in incentives to uh you know keep pe more and more people incarcerated for longer and longer without enough uh redress or or interest in developing the rehabilitative side of it that's got right. completely it's, lost it, in the edu in the, in the system and it's and it's broken it's not about education it's about warehousing and uh what really what fired me up to 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 get involved with this documentary and reach out to Paul was uh Paul de Gelder right was several factors and the one was I saw this movement that I've been involved with since before any of these people becoming more of an elitist kind of thing, this plant based movement and the fucking vegan shit and whatever the fuck and not reaching out to the people that needed the most. And the other thing was I saw the documentary thirteenth. Right. 
And knowing Noah Levine and the work he's done writing Dharma, Dharma punks, punks and going into the prisons and doing the Buddhist ministry and reading articles in Satcha magazine that said, you know, by these inmates, if I had access to this knowledge, I would not be where I am. So all of that lit a fucking fire under my ass. And I'm like, I need to do something to um, try to get out there and show these people that what worked for me can work for anybody. This is the, this is, uh, you know, it's the blueprint on, on, on how to do it. And I'll never forget because um, I remember that back in the day I was doing drugs and drinking and doing all this crazy shit. And, and, and HR from the brains just said, come out on this 30-day tour. You come out on this 30-day tour and you stay off the drugs and you meditate, you meditate, you eat Aital, man. And you're going to see in 30 Aital days. Aital is vital. Aital is vital and Lotal Aital is, is fatal. fatal. <laughs> you're going to see that your life is going to change. And I was like, I went out on the tour. And after 30 days, I was like, my fucking life changed. So that's where the concept but of But also, this you had somebody who took an interest in your life. Mentor. And it was probably the first time that somebody had, or if, if not the first time, one of the few people who'd ever said, like, look, I can see something in this guy. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna to take him under, right? I mean, how much of it is that and how much is it the actual practices, right? It's just, just the feeling, the sense that there's somebody out there that even, uh, even if it's just on a limited basis, like actually cares enough to like it's ask me to so come. It's so important, man. And it's like, and I'm going to tell you, that's where the title came from, 30 to Life. But we sat down, myself and Paul, when we first met uh, the 12 uh, parolees that are involved in this documentary and we sat in a room and we told them our story and where we came from and then they started going around and, and telling their story and the one brother and he was in um, he was in the worst prisons man and he did he did hard motherfucking time that we can't even imagine he was in um, just the worst places you never want to go and he just broke down crying because he's like, this is the first time I can't believe somebody cares about me enough to come in here and do this and mentor and help us like this. This is, you know, and it, it, it got me emotional, too, because and even today uh, I was working with one of the brothers and he's he writes lyrics and, and poetry and I told him I'm, I'm going to send Dante Ross, the vice president of Warner Brother Records. He signed all these hip-hop dudes in the 80s. He's famous. And I told him, he's coming in next week to talk to you. And his writings and poetry, it was just like, it was all his pain and suffering coming out. And, and it was, you know, he just was so unbelievably moved that, we're there mentoring him. And then this other brother, John, he's 70 years old, man. And he's like, I can't believe. And I seen him in passing today. He's like, I can't believe what y'all is doing for us, man. Well, you know, imagine, like, you know, and I'm sure you can imagine what it must feel like to to go through life without any hope that anything is ever going to change. You know, to be in, to be stuck in this, cycle of of violence and incarceration after a certain amount of time and whatever abuse and you know history gets packed into that like the mental state that you're walking around with has to be self-defeating and has to you know at some point you know be one of hopelessness and so to enter enter that equation and say hey man i'm going to take an interest in you like it seems like a small thing it and ain't. it's so massive you it know and we should we should just say for people that are listening, John and Paul DeGelder, who's been on the podcast, if you haven't listened to my episode with him, you should definitely check that out. Guy, like, is an inspiration, you know, beyond words. You're the one who first introduced me to him. Guy survived a bull shark attack. He lost his arm. He lost his leg. And one of the most positive dudes you're ever going to meet. And his life is completely all about service. He just did, uh, you know, a week on Shark Week. So probably a lot of people saw him yeah. on that. <clears throat> but... You're the one who introduced me to him. He came on the show. He was unbelievable. And you guys teamed up with Kip Anderson from What the Health and Cowspiracy. And you're creating this documentary where you're taking these 25 parolees. Well, oh, 12. 12. Okay. Parolees, 
recently released dudes. Yeah. And they're all living in this place called, it's called Amity House. Amity right? Foundation. Amity Foundation, right. Downtown, downtown LA. And you're kind of putting them through this, this boot camp experience, right? Uh, like a spiritual boot camp. They're going on a plant-based diet for 30 days. We have meditation workshops, training. Uh, they're training for a 5K. Paul DeGelder's taking them skydiving. There's... Uh, uh, NFL player, um, I'm just spacing on his name right now, has been doing yoga and meditation workshops mm-hmm. with them. So it's, you know, they've been going to, to uh, farm sanctuaries to to meet animals. We showed them what the health. Um, it's just all this stuff. And these dudes have come so far, and we're only 15 days into it, and they're like, it's it's like the fucking light came on. And the older dude is, his name is John, man. He's so full of fucking wisdom and his story is insane he was a kid his both his parents were fucking murdered and his uncle took him in and he he sold him into slavery in the fields of fucking of 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 the carolinas to work on plantations and fucking dude he worked seven days a fucking week 365 days a year man he was exploited bad shit happened to him and he has so much fucking knowledge. Everything he says, he waits. And you see him really think it out. And then he speaks. And it's it's epic, man. It's like, it's been the most... And, and I've been back and forth from New York because I'm dealing with other stuff too. But the time I've got to spend with these people, this thing is fucking... And it's setting a, 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 a like the pilot for a program like this for the rest of the country. And I kept telling these people, like, yo, you guys are pioneers, man. People are going to look to this and be like, wow, this is the change that's necessary. You have to change people from within. Mm -hmm. And all I did was take the process that worked for me. And it was a deep, deep, deep search inward to fix the fucked up me. And that's what I even wrote about in the the PMA effect. I'm not cured. I'm I, I'm I'm still a work in progress. I'm still fucking every day. I told this dude today. I said, "Yo, just the other day, I knew this dude had kilos of cocaine, and I was like, fucking, I could like my mind just through this thought, fucking wash through my brain real quick. You could take that cocaine. Imagine all the freebasing you could do with all that cocaine. Like that thought actually manifested in my fucking course, enemy man. mind. Yeah, I, I mean, I I get that." You know, I entertain crazy thoughts like that all the time. Like once an addict, always an addict. Yeah. You know, so you have to be you have to be vigilant. You have to be vigilant well, I, in your daily I, I, practice. I told these, just, yeah. They're they're blessings though. They're little reminders. Absolutely. You know, they, they make you rem- because if you forget where you came from, you're likely to go back. If you don't remember your past, you're doomed to repeat it. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, it's just been a blessing to me to work with these guys and uh, and offer them opportunities and. They, many of them have dreams to do cer- certain things and it's just like you know they don't have access to that knowledge or a way to get that done and that's what we're trying to do yeah. whether it's chefs coming in there and saying hey man if you want to get trainers that are like yo you could get an NASM certification and make six figures a year training people or whatever it is that they want to do have a dream and go after it and that's that's kind of what we we've been instilling in these men. You know, you should have. Do you, are you still looking for mentors to go and talk to these guys? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you should get you should get George Raveling. You know George Raveling. I, I had him on the podcast. Um, you should you should listen to this this episode that I did with him. Legendary African American basketball coach, like one of the greats of all time, uh, who has become this extraordinary mentor to young people. Like he's just revered in the NBA and in college wow. basketball. Um, one of the great all-time guys. And he's also this huge civil rights activist. He was standing, when he was a young dude, he was standing right next to Martin Luther King wow. when he delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And after the speech, Martin Luther King handed him the paper with the speech written on it, and he has it. Dude. <laughs> he's an incredible, I mean, he's an older guy. He's in his 70s. Can we reach out? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll reach out. I saw, him, I saw him recently. The, um, they will fucking bring him in yeah, in a second to yeah, talk to if, these if people. He, I'm sure he'd be up for it. Tell um, him, man. Tell him, what's, uh, you know, reach out. I'll put him in touch with uh, with Kip and the, and the producer. Uh, 
Uh, that would just yeah, fucking cool. be amazing. How's the uh, how's the plant based diet going over with these dudes? They fucking love it because we have this chef. He's cordon bleu. He has. Uh, yeah, he came and cooked us dinner on our anniversary Dude, last time you were over here, man. He has not Unbelievable. repeated a dish twice in the whole fucking time that he's been cooking. Now the other Talk about Seva. That guy's level, uh, like his service consciousness is off the charts. Dude, he came down here on his own dime, packed up his car. He fucking works. He works 14 hours a fucking day. Now they want to give him a job there because he helps clean up the whole kitchen. He works with the chef's... Like he's just, we're never going to find a guy like this. Dude, he's like an amazing, uh, amazing, uh, amazing dude, man. Jay, Mm -hmm. um, and he was a chef. That's how he met Kip. He did pop up, plant based pop up things in San Francisco, and Kip went to one of them, and he's like, "Yo, bro, you're a fucking amazing cook." And then uh, they said, we want to do something with you down the road. And Vic Kip was talking about opening up a plant-based pizzeria. And then he called Jay. And, and Jay thought, he's like, I got this project. And he's like, what, the pizzeria? He's like, no, I'm doing this film. I want you to come down. And it manifested out of there. But the guy's so humble. And his service attitude is just... I mean, I'm just looking at the guy, and I'm like, wow, man, you're fucking, you're the real deal. You're the real fucking deal. You have compassion. Now, the other inmates who are, who are paroled to the, they're not inmates, they're parolees, they're seeing the food, and they're like, yo, man, yo, vegan power. Like, fucking, can I That's get, crazy. can I get, I want to get plates of that stuff. So now he's having to cook for, he makes extra food for the other guys who uh-huh. want it now, because they're seeing the films. And it's there's something about as as sort of you know out there as it may sound, and I know you're on the same page with me on this. You're taking these people who have lived a life of violence, you're removing the violence from their life in a very practical, material way, but by eliminating the violence on their plate, there is a spiritual impact to that 100 percent. and there's a lot of people who will call bullshit on that and that's like you know woo woo or whatever but i had that at my you know i didn't come into this to live some holier than thou lifestyle or or to save the animals that was not my perspective right. but i have found in the 11 years that i've been doing this that i have grown into a a you know a perspective of ahimsa that kind of surprised me you know and i think there is something about you know cleansing your life of not just practices and foods and things like that there's a there's a there's a there's a cleansing aspect to that and so my question really is like is that something that you can see evident in the like how long have these guys been doing this 15 days yeah it's only it's been two weeks yeah and and they would get first of all they're getting their blood work back and one of the guys who was one of the guys is in remission of cancer he has cancer and his and the other guys uh you know they've been eating prison food man it's the worst shit you could ever imagine they have all kinds of health problems and now the dude told me today he's like the doctor is like yo you know, in, it was saying like your your health and everything is turning around. Like we're seeing because they're doing blood work on the guys. So not only is the health turning around, uh, they're grasping the message because that's the first thing I said. I learned it from Rastafarians, and Rastafari literally means Prince of Peace. So when I first was told about this thing it was like we don't have the right to kill these animals and do this shit that we're doing to these animals that is affecting your consciousness and one of the things i even said on the back of meat is for pussies it says that i credit removing the violence from my plate being the catalyst for change in my entire life something clicked when i abstained for 30 days from animal flesh Something clicked in my consciousness, man. It was, it was, you know, it was removing that karma from my life. And, and, you know, imagine the the pain and suffering. And I, and I, I've been saying this a lot too because now I have a dog, and we rescued this pit bull. He's fucking amazing. 
and you look in this dog's eyes, man, just like your beautiful dog's hair, there's a soul there, man. There's consciousness. The dog feels love. The dog feels pain. And it's made me more of a fucking warrior to to stop and spread the message of what we're doing to these animals on this planet. And I was just in Europe, and we would be passing the, the, the pig trucks and this truck and that truck. Yeah, I saw you posted about that. Oh, my March. God, it's fucking fucked me up, man. I was like... You know, you look in the eyes and the fear there, and you realize that in a few hours, that living entity, that being is no longer going to be alive because some motherfucker wants to eat a fucking sausage. We ha- we're going to destroy the life, and we have incarcerated that animal. We've created a holocaust for the animals on this planet. We've actually turned this planet into a... Prabhupada said we've turned this planet into a hellish planet for the animals. And that's what we're doing. And we don't have a right to do that to these to these animals. And I speak from my own experience. You could call it hippie bullshit or whatever the fuck you want. But I'm telling you right now, some of the baddest, toughest motherfuckers that I've ever fucking come in contact in my life, when they went and they abstained from the animal shit, the light switch came on. This ain't hippie shit. This is real shit that we're talking. The ahimsa is real shit. And when you come from a life of violence and seeing people's throats get cut in front, fucking shot and murdered in front of you in prison and all this shit that myself and these guys have personally witnessed, San Quentin and fucking, they've been in the worst prisons, man. You know, Pelican Bay and fucking Mm -hmm. like just every fucked up place, Chino, every place you could possibly imagine that is hell on earth. And then you're telling these dudes, look, man. Remove the violence from your life completely. You're in this program, but you're still ingesting violence and you're surrounding yourself by violence because you're responsible, because you're eating that, you're part of the karmic chain of that animal. And that animal, and Prabhupada said, anyone who grows the animal, anyone who transports the animal, anyone who kills the animal, anyone who cooks the animal, and anyone who eats the animal gets the karma. And... From my own personal experience, I know that to be the truth. Like, I don't want to have a hand in that. So, At the same time, you know, it's worth, it's worth mentioning or recognizing that, that, you know, ahimsa, this, this idea, this, this ideal of, 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 of avoiding harm <clears throat> is, is just that. It is an ideal. Like, none of us are karma-free. No. You know? I know that you don't look at yourself as any better than anybody else or Hell stand on no. a podium or anything like that. And just by virtue of, of us existing, we're contributing on a karmic level to, you know, to, to problems, no matter what you're ingesting, right? So it's really about, like, how can I reduce that? Yeah, it's reducing, impact. just like you're reducing your, 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 your carbon footprint, you want to reduce your karmic footprint, you know, you can't stop the killing. There's bacteria in your stomach that you're eating food that's killing the bad bacteria. So, you know, it's that's the material world. One living entity is food for the next. There's always going to, whatever's being born, it's going to, it's going to, you know, you're born, you grow, you produce some offspring, you dwindle and you die. That's, that's the material world mm-hmm. in a nutshell. That's what's happening. But where you, what you do between birth and death, that's up to you to take the proper action and say, hey, man, you know, I'm going to live this life that's going to be more conscious and aware of what I'm doing and not just be this blind consumer, you know, consuming these products and sucking up this shit that's oozing out of the fucking TV with this politics. And that's why I said, yeah, it's become the divided states of America. And that's what these people are doing now. It's like they know what the fuck time it was to be electing this guy Trump and all this shit and the divisiveness that's gone that's going on in this it's it's sick and those labels in those walls exist even with people's diets and people's religions and people's everything that's why it says that one swami said about Prabhupada that he built a house that the whole world could live in peacefully because what are the principles? Until some other assholes moved into it yeah. and fucked it up, right? Yeah, some squatters. <laughs> <laughs> they had to get kicked the fuck yeah. out. <laughs> but let's talk, let's talk about uh, service a little bit. Like you're somebody – I mean you're really an inspiration to me for 
the 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 level you know the service aspect of your life is really the priority of everything you do right and that 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 really like i've watched you over the years and time and time again i've seen you as somebody who's had opportunities to kind of capitalize on this and monopolize on this like get a better apartment or kind of just do what we do as humans as humans with aspirations to you know live better lives and consistently i see you make choices where you walk away from those things in order to ensure that your your priority of being of service is always first and foremost like intact whether that's the soup kitchens that you do or you know whatever it is bro like this documentary like everything that you do is about that is about helping people and and i'm interested in like your perspective on on how like what i know is that people that that live in that place which is a place i aspire to live in more are are the people that ultimately not only have the biggest impact on on the world in a positive way, well, I shouldn't say always, but I see the impact of that, but they're also the most purpose-driven, fulfilled, and the happiest. I, I have to say, uh, you know, that's true. I mean, my happiness is not derived from getting the next thing or you know, I, and I I wrote about this in, in this book. I I said that somewhere along the line, I realized that having a lot of shit ain't what brings you happiness because I never had nothing, and I've given what I did make when I had it. I gave it away, and my mom she couldn't understand when I took a hundred and fifty thousand dollars that I had saved up and opened up the yoga center, and then maintained it for ten years. You know, spending probably close to half a million. She's like, you could as a non like it, it, it's you, a it non for free, right? Yeah, I didn't get anything. As a matter of fact, I did the construction in the place too on, at ninety three St. Mark's, and then I just turned over the key, and I was kind of like the protector of the place, making sure nobody came there and fucked with it or did anything. What's known as like the temple commander, I, I just made sure nobody fucked around and did anything stupid. And when people came in there and and misbehaved, they got a warning. And then the next time, it's like, all right, motherfucker. But the point is, my mother was like, you could have had a house. You could have had all. And I'm like, ma, this is what I want you to do. I want you to come to the Sunday feast. And I want you to meet the people that this place is helping. And the family that we've developed with the community and all these beautiful people that have gotten off drugs and, and, and overcome horrible shit by doing what I did with, with the bhakti yoga. And this is the place that they're, they're learning it and they're healing. So she came to the Sunday feast and she's like, now I understand. She was like, this is the most fucking beautiful thing mm -hmm. that these people... Um, you know, are, are are changing their lives. You're helping so many people. And I'm like, you know, there's a lot of people living in big mansions, man, and they're miserable people and they have no love and, and yeah, all their live, friends they, are they there. They live all around fucking, here. There's and, a lot of them around here. Yeah, we pass some places, yeah. but, you know, everyone's sponging off them and they don't know who to trust. Are they after my money? It's like, if you're my friend, I know you're my friend because you're my friend. I ain't got shit to give you. Only thing I could give you is my time and, and and my service and try to help you. You're not my friend because you could get something from me materialistically. That's I don't have that to offer. And you know I you know when it comes it comes. I'm not attached to it either way. The Bhagavad Gita says you have the right to the work. You don't have the right to the results of the work. That's not what you're supposed to concentrate and meditate on. But the happiness of the service that I've done ever, over over since I learned about it in 81 and started my journey, I wouldn't trade it for the fucking world. If you said to me, yo, you can go back and I'm going to give you fucking $10 million, I wouldn't take it. And that's the God's honest truth. I've turned down TV shows and all kinds of shit because it's not along the lines of my core values and what what I see as important. So... My happiness is not derived from, uh, you know, it's and derived is, from service. That, and what's interesting is that that 
that's very punk rock. It is. You know? It's not selling out. Yeah. You're not supposed to sell out. That's the ethics of punk rock. But too many motherfuckers did sell out. Everybody could talk the talk, but guess what? What does McKee say? True characters revealed under pressure. And when that money came dangling in front of people's faces, you saw a lot of people change and take off one uniform and put on another. This ain't a motherfucking uniform for me. That's why even back in the day, I said, this ain't about fashion and clothes and how you look. Some of the most punk rock motherfuckers I ever met don't look like a punk rocker. Punk rock is a spirit, man. It's a fucking consciousness. It's like, fuck the man. It's about us, the people. And how do we help people? You know, you can't just... And that's one of the things I always said about punk rock. I'm like, it ain't enough to just fucking complain about something and bitch about it. How do we fix it? And that's where... That's not punk rock. Punk rock is more like anarchy, like blow it up, right? They're not big on solution. Yeah, well, that was what I was finding. (laughs) But then I was seeing people like the Bad Brains and Crass who started organic plant-based communities Mm -hmm. and fucking this and that. And like... You started hearing about other people and Chrissy Hine and what she into and she's into Vedic stuff and and all these different people and even the guy from the dam, Captain Sensible, was vegan and like all of this. You you saw an underlying spirituality in the in the punk rock movement mm-hmm. and a lot of people in the movement like i said when i was getting down with this shit in 81 and 82 there wasn't too many aware conscious punk rockers a lot of them motherfuckers laughed that i stopped eating meat and that i would go to the krishna temple and meditate and go do yoga oh what do you i mean they would say it to my face well there's a straight edge you know movement within later. punk, but that was later right that came yeah. later and that was part of the whole kind of judgmental. They didn't. They didn't come at people on the same level. They came at people thinking they were superior to everybody else, and that's why everybody hated that fucking movement. And that's why everybody <laughs> hated the fucking vegan movement because they didn't come at a compassion. A lot of people just were like, "I have this knowledge that makes me superior to you. I'm even going to fucking, you know, talk down to you like I'm better than you." And I think that's changed a lot now uh, because more and more conscious people are getting into this for the right reasons. Like I said, I see it as a positive thing. And a lot of those people's voices uh, got silenced. As a matter of fact, I've seen a lot of them go back to eating meat and 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 and, uh, and, and leaving punk rock and straight edge and, and going back to do drugs and all kinds of shit. So when you get into something for the wrong reasons, that's not going to sustain. Your values and your desire will always be tested in life, whatever the fuck you pick up and decide to attach yourself to. That's why I don't put any of them labels on myself. I know what my ultimate service is. It's bhakti yoga. Well, that sanctimony doesn't help anybody. Yeah. You know, and I think... When somebody's coming from that perspective, or you can feel that vibe where they're 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 rolling up with a, a level of uh, you know superiority yeah. around whatever idea it is, whether it's veganism or or whatnot, um, that's not attractive and it doesn't work. And usually, it's a reflection of the pain that that person is carrying around, or their 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 need to. <clears throat> adhere to a certain ideology or belong to a particular tribe in order to feel safe and okay in the world. So it it really speaks more about that person than anybody else. But ultimately, it's not in service to, you know, greater humanity, because it's preventing people from accessing ideas that might be helpful to them. And and what I love about you is, is, is this is this devotion to transcending the label um, and rolling up on people from a from a perspective of of compassion and non judgment and you know that's a, that's a higher that's an elevated perspective that's you know how I'm I'm trying that's how I you know aspire to communicate with people you do it, and ultimately I mean, you, you know, know that 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 is giving you the better chance of being able to connect with another human being in a very real way. And ultimately, that's the only way you're ever going to be able to communicate a message that will be um, potentially helpful to them in a real way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, 
even in this place where I'm at with these guys, like society looks down on them and have treated them in this program. Uh, you know, society looks down on them as, as, as trash. And if you saw 13th, the documentary, they replaced the word slave with criminal. See, it's the whole thing. It's still that slave mentality yeah, that they can that. label them as criminal. And it's like, okay, now we don't have to give a fuck about these people. They're criminals. The depersonalization. Of yeah, it's thing. deep. It, that, that's exactly what it is. It's like, don't even treat them as humans. They're fucking criminals. And they're trying to do away with this whole thing, too, now. You saw that about, I think it's called the Block, Bock the, Bo, uh, Block the Box campaign or whatever. No, I have seen remove, that. What is that? It's to remove off the job applications that they've been convicted of a crime. It's happening in California. There's a big push for that right now. And so I th- you don't have to disclose that you're yeah, a felon. Yeah, and I think that that's true because, yo, if you paid your debt to society and you did the time, why should you continuously be punished? Mm-hmm. These guys can't even get jobs, not that they should, at McDonald's just to show you or a fucking janitor or whatever. It's like somebody has to give a fuck enough about human beings to say, hey, man, I'm willing to take a risk on you and let you come and, you know, work at my establishment. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, I I give props to Tal Ronan because Crossroads, you know, he never judges anybody, man, whether they did a crime or whatever. He treats them like family, fucking, um, you know... It's 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 like there's so much love going on in that restaurant, and I think above the food being amazing, I think it's really because of the love that exists. When you go in that kitchen, man, these guys are like they fucking love Tal, mm. and, and and just knowing that dude, he's so real and genuine, and he really means it, and and and, and gave guys a second chance, and I I, I think. Seeing the humanity in people, man, even though, we, you know, they might have made fucking pretty bad mistakes, but anybody can change. And that's the whole thing, you know. Anybody can and the system needs to change. Exactly. Like you, 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 uh, you listen to my episode with, with John McAvoy, Fuck right? Yeah, I listen to that shit was fucking and what he's doing I mean, now. Look what that guy has, has Holy done. Holy shit. And it started with, I mean, there was a lot of internal drive on his part but it was sparked by a prison guard who took an interest in him when he didn't have to there you, you go know? the and guy would show that, up on his yeah. days off and come in and work with him with the rowing and right and showed an interest like yo this guy gives a fuck about me and he's not trying to get anything from me he's fucking he honestly cares he sees something these people have been made to have no va- they don't value themselves so when somebody else comes in and says, hey, man, you have value, man, like it, it, it just. And at first you have to overcome the the <clears throat> the guarded skepticism because that person's going to be like, what's your angle? Like no one's it's ever rolled like up that. on me like that. So it's like, hey, man, where are you coming it's from? Like, I, it's just a ticking time bomb until you're going to drop on me whatever it is you're trying to get out yeah. of me. Right. So. You have to earn that trust over time. Like, it can't just happen with one person being nice one day. Like, you have to be committed to overcoming that hurdle in order to engender the trust in that individual that will ultimately catalyze that change. And that requires, that's a, that's a big ask. That's a big investment on it has somebody's to be part. Selfless. When you see somebody do that. Like, that's an amazing thing. Well, it has to be selfless, too. You know, it has to, it's selfless service. It's, uh, you know, what it says even in the Vedic teachings is, de- is devotional service to others has to be unmotivated and uninterrupted. And that means unmotivated by, you know, material Personal things game. other than the person's own growth and and uninterrupted if you're not seeing the result. Imagine you're trying to do something. And, and I've tried to – listen, I've tried to help a lot of people. These three kids yeah, that were Yeah, most of them, it doesn't work they, out. They raped yeah. and murdered a woman, wow. you know, and it's like – it has to be un, you know unmotivated and uninterrupted meaning like sometimes you're not always going to get the result right away but you have to just keep endeavoring and endeavoring and you know the material conditioning is so heavy in this material world that you know we've been doing fucking crazy shit for this lifetime past lifetimes there's a there's a lot of conditioning that that's there and everybody's working out their karma but you know I'm even seeing it with these guys now they're trusting 
uh, when we first get in there, they were all like, yeah, what's this motherfucker's angle? What the right. fuck, yo? You could see the skepticism. Now they're like, they're like, yo, Jay. Like, they're calling me and they're fucking like, yo, they, they see... I'm not trying to get nothing from them. I'm trying to give, you know. This mo- this whole process, 30 to Life, is about giving. And the story of John McAvee, man, and what he's doing now, because now I follow him on social media, and he's going, he's getting standing ovations for right. h- when he gives these talks. Yeah, he went and spoke at the House of Commons right I after we that. did the podcast. And that video, like, went crazy viral. And I got up. The morning of of Iron Man Hamburg, because I was like, I got, how's he doing? Right, because that was his big race, and as you know, they had to cancel the swim yeah, on that of because the of allergy. freaking yeah, the algae from the runoff and yeah. whatever bullshit is going on there. So there was it was going to be this duathlon, and I log into the Iron Man website wanting to see how he's progressing, and he hadn't even started yet, and I was like, what is, what's going on? Something's wrong. So I DM'd him. And he said, yeah, there was a fuck up. His parole officer had the wrong dates for the Ironman and he couldn't go to the race because they screwed up some paperwork over it. So he couldn't travel because he can't travel yeah, without doing a whole bunch of bullshit. Well, I'm finding um, that with this program now. Right. Trying, Paul's trying to get him skydiving and the parole officers have not, it's out of their zone where they can travel to because right. they're like you know wearing the fucking monitors mm-hmm. and shit so it's like it's a whole thing you know to uh, to get the clearance from the parole officers and you know it's tough it, yeah so he trains for this race this is his big race for the year and then like how, I don't know when he found out how many days in advance but then it's like yeah sorry you can't do that yeah. you know so he's got another race he's signing up to do but yeah. like the the bigger point being like look what that guy has done with his life Amazing, you know, and that is, that is, you know, he he wasn't walking around with PMA from day one. Nah. Like that guy had to evolve into a perspective where now he can be this beacon of light, right? And it's so powerful because not only is that story just beyond belief, like it's just insane, like it, it's so cinematic. It's movie I mean, it is a movie. Uh, uh, when he was telling it on yeah. the podcast, you can see it. You can see the scenes. scenes of I know, your fucking yeah. head. You're like. There's no way, right? Um, and that gives him the gravitas, like the weight, the power right. to be able to speak to these issues. And the fact that he is committed to prison reform, um, you know, that's his version of your service. And when you see Paul de Gelder committing his life to, to shark preservation and the preservation of the oceans, when it, it's the ocean, you know, it is the shark that Covers took three away quarters his of limbs. The planet. You know, the, and it, yeah, and the, it's the shark. He's protecting that which thing, changed his life. Exactly. And I saw him say, I don't know that I would want my limbs back. You know, I think it was on your podcast that he said that. Yeah. If somebody said you can have your leg and your arm back, I wouldn't take it. I mean. It's unbelievable. And you know that he means it. Mm-hmm. So the question for you is, why? Like, why do you do all this? Um... First of all, I have to say that it's a degree of selfishness in that it's how good it makes me feel to help other people. Genuinely feel how good it is and going out on the food line and feeding people plant-based meals and having these conversations with people and 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 helping people and every day writing letters to people and getting people I mean every day I get 20 to 30 fucking emails on social media or or my e- I'm going to read you one right now. I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to read you an email that came in that you got but it also was sent to me. Can I do this? Yeah. All right. I'm not going to say the person's name, but goes like this uh hey rich i also sent this to john joseph uh couldn't find your direct email blah 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 i wanted to reach out personally because of the impact you and john have had on on me over the last few years here's the email in its entirety rich and john i just wanted to say thank you for the impact you've had on my life over the last few years i have ulcerative colitis and struggled for the better part of 10 years with flare-ups and hospitalizations I was lucky to avoid surgery, but that didn't mean I had a good quality of life. Eventually, I went on a drug that cost $25,000 a year, 
It's known to cause cancer in some patients, but to me it outweighed the higher risk of colon cancer due to chronic inflammation. During this time, about three years ago, I was also trying to make positive changes in my life to try to get off this cancer-causing drug. While I was thankful for the effects of pharm- pharmaceutical interven- intervention played on my symptoms, I was also aware that blah, blah, blah. Canada had the highest IBD rates. Counties like Japan and China had very few. Uh, da, 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 da. I listen to audiobooks and podcasts frequently. I was listening to Finding Ultra on Audible. I, I interjected it with an episode where uh, Ben Hobbs interviewed John Joseph. It led me to JJ's interview with Rich. The rest of the podcast didn't take long before I was convinced that a plant-based diet was my only option. I struggled at first, but eventually came around. And after three or four months, I was nearly 100% plant-based. My goal was just to increase fiber intake, blah, 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 blah. Basically, uh, it cured his ulcerative colitis, essentially. He's, his doctor said he'd never seen such a wild turnaround. Um, and that the only cases where he saw this kind of healing were mild cases with very few flare-ups. Um, he goes on and on and on. Uh, and he refuses to say he's, he's cured. It's still too early. The disease is complicated. But he's basically found freedom, you know, and it's through your message, dude. And I know you get emails. Like, and, and I'm not reading this to, like, butter you up or to, or to be self-congratulatory. Like, it's just – it's powerful, dude. And I will echo your sentiment. Like, there's nothing better than getting an email like that knowing you help that, that you're helping somebody in a very real way. And it's just, it's just words on a computer screen. But, you know, not for that dude. No. That's, that's, that's fucking years of pain and suffering – that's in that email and and, you know the thing that was told to me is like how do when i asked my teachers how do i repay you they just said teach the next person in line pay it forward and that's that's really what it's all about and when i say that in a selfish way i mean that the the joy that's derived from helping people it's it's incredible and it's not that I'm trying to have this Jesus complex or any fucking stupid shit like that because I try to always turn it back on them and I say, yo, I put the information out there, but you, sir, ma'am, you did the work. You get the kudos, not me. Mm-hmm. All I did was yeah, give... It's like this guy, he did the He changed his life. You did the life. work, you know how... And I wrote about you in my new book and I was like, do you know what it fucking took for you to kick alcohol and do all the stuff that you did, the intestinal fortitude that that took to change your diet and, and do, and do you know, um, the ultras you've done and do uh, the Epic Five and, and, you know, constantly being put under pressure, you know, is the revelation of true character, who the fuck you really are. And, you know, to me, it's like to get asked, you know, why... It's the one answer that I would give is 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 like we have a debt. We our lives were saved. Your life was safe. People mm-hmm. people helped you. Even Julie and oh, you read all this stuff. Uh, dude, so many people. It's helped like we you. have a debt. How the fuck do we? How the hell do we repay the fact that Cause I didn't go to time. prison and get fucking killed on the streets for for being a drug addict and robbing crazy motherfuckers? Like, how do I repay that? And the only way is to constantly, every day I wake up, I touch my head to the floor and I say my mantras, and I've done that for the last, since I ever heard about it in in 81, 37 years, even in my crack period and pill period, I wake up and I touch my head to the floor, Namon Vishnu Bhadaya, Krishna Mastaya Budale, I say my mantras, and I give thanks for another day on earth. And now, because of all the work I've done on myself, I say, you know, send me someone to help today. I'm looking for that, you know, to, to be like, let me find somebody that's... And I get letters about, like, dude, I literally had the fucking gun in my mouth. And, like, I got one letter like that about the lyrics in the Cro-Mags that this song I wrote, Malfunction... And how, like, you know, people's lives have just been helped. That's the greatest, you know, feeling in the world that you helped somebody who was suffering. Because, like, we're living in a world where it's like 
people are acting like it's not cool to be compassionate and care about someone. It's this. It's because look at this shit that's mm-hmm. going on with this whole fucking presidency and everything it's like fuck you separating mothers from their children and putting them in fucking camps and all this crazy shit it's like fuck you i have my political beliefs i don't care if you're suffering all this shit that's going on we just have to pull back from that and say hey man this is a living being man this is a human being with feelings and emotion and you know can you know, has the ability to do amazing things with their life. Like, I, I want to fan that spark, man. I don't want to throw water on it. I want to help whatever good. Look for the good, the center of good in people. That's what you have to look for and try to fan that spark, man. How can we make compassion cool? You know, how can we make caring cool? You know, we're in this age of irony, irony and, 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 you know, flippant skepticism and anger and, 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 and fear and, and, and a a zero sum attitude about the world. If you get this, then I don't get mine and fuck you. I think it comes down to the core value system again, because there's prisons filled with motherfuckers that thought that way. And it's like, I'm going to get mine no matter what. Or you get people in the material world. I'm going to exploit everybody and get mine no matter what. I don't care who the fuck they uh, they step on. But there has to be a spiritual awakening. And spirituality is, is becoming cool. It's It's not... And I'm not talking about the people who go to yoga class and stand on their fucking head and then they go eat fucking <laughs> steak tartare and fucking and do all this other crazy shit and fucking banging. You know, that's not yoga. That's gymnastics. There's a real spirituality to uh, intense work on oneself. And I think there's a lot more people uh, that can smell the lie now and the hypocrisy that exists everywhere. And they're looking outside of that whole system of just bullshit and the lies it's we're becoming oversaturated with bullshit it's being just pumped at us constantly on billboards and fucking we're seeing all these people even you know they 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 just get above people and exploit the fuck out of them all over the world and and nobody's caring and it's like i i just think like the way the way to to heal all of that is 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 to let People find it for themselves, but point them in the direction so that they feel like they made the journey because ultimately mm-hmm. they are. Like, I just point people in the direction of the knowledge. I say, bro, go down this fucking rabbit hole and do some motherfucking research. And then I get, and I tell them, read this book, that book, go look at this documentary, check this out, see what this is about. And then they do it and they come back and they're like, yo. And I just got like five messages today. I've been plant-based for a month, man. I feel fucking great. I started doing yoga. Like, mm-hmm. I, I stopped drinking. Like, yo, even me and my wife, the whole, our relationship's better. You know, and, and, and a lot of other things come into play, too, with helping people. Because I'm, my life is the result of, like, crazy shit that my father subjected my mother to so it's like a lot of these people have kids and if they don't fix their damaged selves perpetuating what's gonna you're perpetuating the circle the 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 cycle of abuse and and incarceration and everything and and the similar uh, the common denominator of a lot of these guys is broken families man how do we tighten up the family look at the beautiful things that go on in your house with your kids and how you and julie love each other and are nurturing to your kids and setting the proper example you guys set the example and that's why i keep saying examples better than precept you could talk all the shit you want about yoga and this and that motherfuckers don't care about that because there's a lot of mouthpieces out there that just talk shit talk shit and then when you really pull back that mask and you see what the fuck is behind there that's an ugly ass person and i don't mean that on a physical i mean that inside that person is nothing that anyone's attracted to because it's it's all they're developing the bad qualities it's it's um Instead of the you know the, the uh, four agreements, it's they practice the four disagreements as a, as so to speak. So, you know, look at you know that that family, and I think the family 
uh, makeup has changed a lot too. And that's why I'm like, yo, if two women or two men want to adopt a kid and them parents fucked up and they caused that fucking kid so much pain, so what? If those people want to love that person, why the fuck should they not be allowed to adopt kids? Like, they're going to give that kid a nurturing home. They're not looking to do... You know, and that's the thing that these homophobic people and all these people, they're like, oh, yeah, who knows what they want to do with... It's like, that's your twisted fucking brain. You are projecting. Well, who was it that said the, the, the only source of self... Uh, the, when we criticize others, that's the real true source of self, uh, uh, of what you're projecting. Yeah, it's a window in your, into your own yeah. soul. I don't know who originally said but that. But it's like, but. you know, I think the family uh, structure is, is uh, a very important thing. It's super important. Um, I want to talk about... I, I want to ask one question yeah. though, before we jump ahead to that because I had a question about John McAvoy. Did you get into like plant-based diet with him at all? Or no. Uh-uh. You didn't? No, it wasn't about that with him. Yeah. You know, I just I wanted to share his story which is so powerful. Right. Like, I f- that would have been a distra- He's not, you know, yeah. he's not vegan. He's not on a plant-based yeah. diet. <laughs> you know, if I want to have that conversation with him later, but th- it felt that would not have been appropriate. Yeah. You know? But that's what I love about you, and you have people on your podcast that have amazing stories of triumph and, and stuff like that, and you put them on there regardless if they're plant-based or not. It's the story that's inspiring your podcast is inspiring dude i gotta tell you i sat downtown and the last couple days fucking i was eating outside this vegan spot and and i had literally five people come up to me and were like yo man you know heard you on the rich roll podcast man i fucking love rich roll like i'm i'm doing triathlon now because of that shit and like like just the amount of people that you have inspired through your podcast and these inspiring people that come on and are doing amazing things i mean you know well i appreciate that um i mean look man you know you 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 bring the fire you bring the heat every time you're here so people are connecting with you i just i'm like a cipher like i get to be the conduit so that you can share your truth more broadly and it's a privilege and an honor to be able to 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 have the platform to be able to do this Um, and I think to your point about kind of bifurcating these conversations, it's like, yeah, I have tons of plant-based vegan people on, but like, like you said, like I'm more than like, I'm more than that. And just because somebody, uh, isn't on a plant-based diet, does that then exempt them from having an inspirational story? Of course not. That's ridiculous. To the dogmatic vegans, uh, yeah, that's why I don't fuck with Look at what this guy overcame. You're going to then judge him because he doesn't eat the way that you eat? Like, to me, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It doesn't. So so he's not capable of, of, of providing you with some insight and some wisdom that can be helpful to you. I think if you're coming from that perspective, then... And, and it, you know, I think that's, if you're coming from that perspective, you're robbing yourself of an opportunity to low and to, to grow and learn. Every individual that you come across has something that you can learn from. Absolutely. You know, like in recovery, there's that thing like, hey, man, <clears throat> you learn as much from the people that go out as the people that stay in. Everybody carries the message one way or the other. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's up to you to be able to have the insight to figure out okay, what, is, what can I glean from that person's experience that can be helpful for me? And there isn't a human being walking on planet Earth that you can't learn from. And if you're coming from a holier-than-thou perspective and think, well, that guy doesn't see the, way, the world the way that I do, so you know, screw him or I can't learn from him, then you're the, you're, the, you're the one who's losing out. You're missing out. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I want to talk about the new book. Um, but before we do that, you mentioned a couple minutes ago, like you meet these people, you try to be of service and helpful to them, and you recommend you're like, what? Read this book, you know, watch this. Doc. Like, what are the? So if you're if you had to like write down, here's the list of of things that are your most recommended books or movies. What's on that list? Uh, uh it's podcasts too, and uh, first and foremost, I, I tell them the the documentaries uh, for their diet, which is obviously Forks Over Knives, What the Health. 
I tell them to check out Earthlings for the compassion and Cowspiracy for the environment. So, you know, those are really the top uh, films that I'll tell them uh, to check out. And books, there's even this one I quote all the time. The Prophet, Prophet, one of Uh the first books I read. Uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is. um, And The Science of Self-Realization. That was the book. Actually, uh, I even said in Evolution of a Cro-Magnon, my memoir, that, you know, if you want, I'll send you this book. And I've sent out thousands of copies of the book, which, uh, you know, I paid for myself, Mm -hmm. bought the book, shipped it, paid for everything. So The Napoleon Hill books, too, The Napoleon Hill, absolutely. Um, You know, there's, uh, you know, for self-help and, you know, he he wrote some great books and uh even like the i ching mm-hmm. you know and uh i mean i've read so many you know even you know you can even check out the krishnamurti books i love that ram das book be here, be here now. now it's just great inspirational quotes Did i tell and, you a story about that yeah so ram das is not the guy who said be here now be here now was uttered by Bhagavan Das. So Ram Das arrives in India. He's searching for his guru. He's convinced he's going to find his guru. He's walking all over the place, meeting with everyone. It's like not working out. And Richard Alpert, you know, Harvard professor is his real name. Yeah. And he's and he's sort of dismayed and thinking, well, maybe this isn't where I'm supposed to be. He's starting to question why he went to India in the first place. And he's about to, like, pack his bags and come back home. And he runs into this dude who's, like, 6'7", young, handsome guy with the long hair and the the whole... He's American, but he's got, like, all the garb on, right? He's got the sandalwood on his forehead, and he's barefoot, and it's, like, 1968 or whatever it is. And and the guy's like, come, I'm going to take you to this guru. And they're walking and they're walking and like Richard Albert, a.k.a. Ram Dass, is like, when are we going to get there, man? When is this, this is far. Like, how long are we walking? You know, he just kept like, he was so impatient. Like, he wasn't right. present in the experience of this adventure. And finally, Bhagavan turned around to him and said, like, be here now. That becomes the name of the book. Right. Ultimately, they end up at the feet of Neem Karoli Baba, who becomes, you know, who names Ram Dass, Ram Dass becomes wow. his guru and all that whole thing. Uh, but Bhagavan, have you ever met Bhagavan? No. Because he would do kirtan at Jiva Mukti in New York. He spends a lot of time in upstate New York, et cetera. But Bhagavan married, My friend knows married Julie and I. There's a portrait of him in the other really? room. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's cool. I want to see that. And he did a, and he's an amazing musician. And he did a, 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 a kirtan album that was produced by one of the Beastie Boys. I think Mike D. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Oh, I think okay. It's maybe... Uh, I think it was. Always, my, no, we, was it well, Yout MCA? Well, who's the one who's the biggest yogi? That's uh, Mike D. I think it was Mike D. Who yeah. lives out in Malibu? Yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's Mike D. Yeah. Um, wow, that's amazing. Anyway, man. yeah, yeah. So he was. <laughs> wow. He's a character because he's he's not like a guru type guy. Like you can talk to him like a normal. He's very right. you know like he's actually pretty funny, dude. Wow, anyway, that's crazy. I'll tell you more stories about that later. But anyway, all right, dude, let's talk about well, well, the PMA effect. Well, 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 Come on, we, man. We didn't, we didn't finish with that because we got to the books and the films and I also, right. you know. Um, but Be Here Now is an amazing Be book. Be Here Now, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of truth in there. And then, you know, the Krishnamurti teachings. But mainly I try to just, t- I, I really tell people, you know, the Prabhupada books. And then podcasts. And you, mm-hmm. I, I have to say, not just because you're sitting here, I say, look, man. Go on the Rich Roll podcast and look at the guests and go through that. There's lessons to be learned. And what was the? Um, I just sent somebody because they were a swimmer and they were going to do this big swim. What, what was the woman's name? Kimberly. And, uh, Kimberly. She uh, like broke a foot and yeah, like, yeah. She has. Um, she's got a disease right now. Wow. Yeah. Um, I I can't remember the name of it. Um, right now but she's uh yeah she's incredible yeah, yeah and she i swam told from the Farallon to Islands that, yeah. and like you know shark infested waters and like, yeah. and like fucking and so there's always something Kim swims you know all the different p- 
people that you had on your podcast, it's like there's stories there for everybody. I think it's a very powerful medium uh, podcast to uh, help people. So that's really what I I tell people uh, in a nutshell. Just just do the research. And people... You know, want to feel like they discovered it. They, you, you, you just point them in the right direction and then let them, uh, you know, and detach. Find from, their truth. You got to detach from your expectations or your exactly. attachment as to whether anybody's going to do it. And that's that's a painful lesson that you learn in 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 recovery when you're trying to help people get sober because you carry the message, <clears throat> and you know, nine times out of ten, it doesn't it doesn't stick. You know, but you just keep doing it. You keep doing right. it. You just stay out of the results. You know exactly. You just keep. That's exactly what it is, man. It's like I tried to help my nephew. He's incarcerated again, and then there's another kid that. And I talk about this in the book. They they all made fun of this kid Matt because he was a nice kid and a sweet kid, and they called him. They called him all kinds of fucked up names and made fun of him. Matt got an apartment he graduated college he has a wife he has a kid coming he mm-hmm. fucking has a job and we're all these other dudes that made fun of him it's not cool to be kind right but they're all fucking locked up including my nephew who made fun of him cause he I'm had a little bit that. of a learning yeah. disability Matt but he worked so fucking hard to cure himself of that and graduate college and I'm so proud of him. He calls me Uncle John, and it's funny because he's like this six foot seven, you know, black man now. But I knew him as a teenager, and you know, people are like they're like Uncle John, like you know, this <laughs> fucking short white right. motherfucker, like right. you know, That's it's funny, pretty man. funny, you know. But I love the kid, man. He comes, I, he comes to every event that I do. He came to the to the last. Uh, the book thing uh, when we did the meet us of pussies. He oh, the dead. one downtown at the yeah, last bookstore. Yeah, store? he yeah, was yeah. the fucking mm-hmm. uh, no, the one uh, in New York when we did it at. Oh, um, uh, when I was when I was there when your mom was there. Yeah, yeah he was okay. there too, and then he came for the evolution. Remember, right, right, you know, right. That place thing. in Brooklyn's not there anymore. Yeah, I know it closed bookstore. down. It's crazy. Um, all right, dude. PMA effect. You got this new book coming out. The PMA effect. Are you showing it there? Yeah, like, dude, do you have any printed copies? You could have had one sitting right here. No, nah, I don't um, yet, because uh, we just... Um, I don't need it. I read it. Yeah. I re- you know, I read it already. Actually, you Thank wrote you very the much. forward, and I you wrote it. Forward. You always fuck me up, man, because you're so eloquent, and then I got to... It's like, you're like the toughest act to follow. Like, but I couldn't write like writing. you. If I if I tried to write like you, I would sound like an idiot. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I can only write the way that I write. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's amazing. It, the the forward is amazing. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, man. You know for for that <clears throat> gift, and it is a gift. And uh, but the book is is really uh, so many people are going through a lot of shit right now, and I'm like I just I took all the lessons and I and I wrote you know even the homeless person. You know, like you mentioned, had a lesson to teach me in life. Everybody had lessons to teach me. So really, I, I just incorporated a lot of the lessons learned and how I overcame certain things mm-hmm. um, in this world by continuously practicing uh, seeing things uh, from different perspectives and, and working through my shit and trying to keep a positive mindset uh, through all the shit that I was going through. And... You know, four years ago, a little a little under four years ago, I started like, you know, writing stuff down, and and I talk about that. I have a cork board. I don't know if you've been in my house. Yeah, I've it's, seen it. And I, I know your writing room. Yeah. So I pin. I just kept pinning these ideas to the to the fucking wall, and I'm like, fuck, man, the PMA things become such a big thing. I mean, you know, everyone's getting the tattoos. It's on bumper stickers, fucking Napoleon Hill, the bad brains, even fucking, uh, breaking bad. They, you know, they had a P the guy said PMA in the reference. Yeah. And one of the things they, they talked about PMA, man, you better have that fucking PMA. Like, Uh I think it was, uh, somebody said it's a Walt, And, uh, I'm like, there's so much to that. There's so much to resiliency and the methods of, pushing through shit and and how do i do that and uh you know and i said you know even in the intro i'm like yo this book comes from a place of humility i'm i'm not fixed i'm still a work in progress i'm a neophyte on the path Mm -hmm. and all i'm trying to do is 
be the mailman and say, yo, this is the stuff that I've been taught that's helped me thus far in my life and gotten me to where I am. And yes, I have a lot more work to do uh, on myself, but even this book for me is a reminder because it's a lot of knowledge in there. And I even quoted him one of his quotes in the book. Um, the Prophet. Yeah. So it's like it, it was a reminder to me of, of work that I still need to do on myself and I just saw the it. The work's never done. It's never done. We're all we're all works in progress, man. It's and that's really what uh, you know. But it's all about reaching our ultimate potential. And how do we do that? That's why I said how a positive mental attitude can make you the badass you were born to be, because all of us were born to do great things in, with our lives, man. And it you know seeing that in every person and. There's also an artist. There's the unwanted things in Sanskrit that we have to, you know, that we have to clear out of our path. It's like boulders on the path. But that's what Prabhupada said was with knowledge, those boulders become pebbles that you can just kick away. So that's where the right. book was. What I love about the book is it's incredibly accessible and relatable. And there's just no getting around the fact that, that you're this incredibly powerful steward because of your life experience, right? You're standing in a place <clears throat> where you have the gravity to speak to this because of where you came from, you know? And, like, if people want to really hear the whole backstory of Blood Clot, like, you can listen to one of our 10 podcasts. I think Maybe it's the 40, very first 41 one, or whatever. Yeah, was. way back. Or even, you know, you recapped it pretty good on Rogan the other day. Like, yeah. you know, conceived in rape, abuse, 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 foster, you know, foster homes, uh, juvenile detention halls, jails, you know, drug dealing on the streets. Like, just, just a, a road to nowhere. And it's just unbelievable that you were able to transcend that um, to live the life that you're living now. So how do you do that? Like, how does somebody go from there to here? And the fact that you took the time to extract lessons from your life and hang them on the principles that have been transformative in your journey and then communicate them in a way that's relatable to people, I think is, is, is you know, I keep using this word, is powerful. You know, it's powerful, and I think it's really going to help a lot of people, man. So I commend you for, for writing the book. That's why I wrote I it. I, 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 I wrote it because... I really shouldn't be fucking sitting across from you right now. No. Because the statistics, and I had people tell me that shit, that you're just going to be another fucking dead motherfucker or you're going to be a motherfucker that spends the rest of his life in prison. You know, no, you know, but I always had this thing to prove people wrong. Like, because, like, and that was my problem even, even as a kid was I would never let the people that hurt me know that they hurt me. I would act like that shit didn't matter. You're not going to see me fucking cry. I wouldn't cry in front of them. You're not going to see me and my pain. I'm going to keep that. Even when my girl was, pre, pre, was like, you know, it's fucking unbelievable. You went through all that shit. And it's like I never knew how much that shit really affected you because mm -hmm. I'm an expert at hiding my emotions and, 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 and not letting, and it's still one of the things I'm trying to work on now. And that's one of the things I talk about in the book is that, you know, to confront things and don't let them fester. And if, if somebody does something that I'm not happy with, or it makes me feel a certain way, I'm going to get it off my chest. I'm not going to sit there and hold that poison in and 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 let it fester till it till it blows up on something and uh yeah well there's that but then I mean that's an easy example of like somebody pissed you off let's redress it immediately like or even if you fucked up to like rectify it as quickly as possible I have a friend who calls that like if you're going to eat crow like eat it hot you know yeah. like deal with it right away but that's very different from the the compartmentalization of like the abuse that you suffered and trying to put on a happy face and be like well shit happens man pma like i'm just over it and then you're gonna walk around the lower east side and become friends with every shopkeeper that shit's still there dude yeah. so confronting that like peeling back the layers like that's you know 
that's a process. That took you know? that took me all the way to like I said, it didn't happen until I started working on the script and then McKee and that whole mm-hmm. thing that happened with him of him saying that, you know, writing about a character that was abused is the fucking cliche of the day. It's about what a character does uh as a result of that. That's the story. And uh and then he wrote in my book that he signed for me, he goes he goes, John, always write the truth. And, you know, it was about admitting and and coming clean on, on what happened to me. And like I said, I it, it took it took so much work and, and you know there there's the false ego that's there, like, yo, you're this fucking whatever, like, you know, you've been through all this shit, you're so fucking iron tough and whatever the fuck and you know fantasies we have in our own mind which is all false ego that has to be Mm -hmm. stripped away and stand there naked in the fucking you know like at the end of the earth and just be like you know i gotta confront this and and and, uh it took it took decades and forgive 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 and forgive yourself well you know i i mean and i'm not over all of that forgiveness too because i went back to that peep them people's houses and I, I, it wasn't. It, I wasn't able to forgive. Like even the two dudes that were doing that shit to me, I was like, uh, "That's the first thing I said. Where are they?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I don't. Know, when you went back to that foster home, right? I don't know what I would have done. <clears throat> I'm, I, I haven't reached a point where I could be. Do you think that you can get to that place? And if you could. I would have what to get the, it off fr- my. I have to. I would have because to. it's ca- it's causing you suffering. Yeah, you know that. Of course it is because I still have that thing where like I've learned through the writing of this book. Though believe it or not, this has been very therapeutic for me because like I, you know, it had to remind me of this stuff. So I let a lot of other shit go, but I know that that's something. That's part of the work that still needs to be done. Mm-hmm. But there's a part of me that still I can't remove myself from the street person and the fucking uh, dude who has to tell motherfuckers what time it is. And yeah, there's an identity. You're <clears throat> on some level. There's an attachment to that identity, right? Of like, course. and there's an ego. There's of an course. ego aspect of that. I would right? be fucking. So it's like when you I, say I, the work's never done. It's like okay, now I got to look at that, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like that's the one thing. Everything else is. I've been able. To, I forgave my mom. I actually forgave my father. Like I, you know, I forgave certain bandmates who did the fucking most grimy shit to me. Who was supposed to be my friend? You know, don't hold no grudges. I don't give a fuck. But that's the one thing that I'm like, uh, you know, that still kind of haunts me to this day. Mm-hmm. Is ever running into them because like. You know, they took advantage of me and they were bigger than me. And now I'm like, you know, it's kind of like that sleepers thing. If you saw that movie when yeah. the fucking... And like, dude, I, I, I get so fucked up when I see that scene. And every time that shit comes on, because I'm like, you know, I understand. I, could, I, 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 I understand that whole situation, what that dude did to them. And, and, uh, and now they're in the position of putting fear into that person's you know and Kevin Bacon mm-hmm. till I can't he got remember. shot it's been so long since I've seen that movie yeah. but as I recall it like doesn't they went end, to the bathroom they were in a bar and uh, yeah and he went as he went downstairs they got out of prison and all this shit and they were these tough Irish hooligans yeah. and shit and then he goes down to go to the bathroom and he sees him there and he fucking gets that he knows the it's priest him. that abused all of no, them no it was the, it? it was the warden Kevin Bacon was one of the guys uh, that worked at the boys home yeah. he was one of the cops that worked there so then he was eating in the diner and, right because all those guys had been in that boarding house together yeah right? and then yeah. when he comes back upstairs he goes and tells his friend he's like you're not gonna believe who's look who's fucking sitting over there so they both went over there and sat across from him and he's like can I help you? And he's like, remember. take a look at me. You you remember me? And he's looking. And he's like, told him like, yo, the boarding home. And he's like, oh yeah, I remember you, fucking little pricks. And it was just like, you know, he had no forgiveness. 
And that's what I think where I'll lose my shit if they don't fucking just straight up and come out like saying apologizing. Then it could get ugly because that's what I'm looking for, and I it's not gonna you know be any sense of forgiveness and you know. But you know that the spiritual jujitsu is for you to forgive them without an expectation of anything. I know, in return. but that's part of the work. Right? I'm not yeah. at that point right. yet, and it's just you know. It's a traumatic situation um, that's still going to require work on my part. Right. You know, that's a, more of the growth that has to take place. And I know that that's still, you know, when I did Ben Hobbs' podcast, man, I fucking, all of this shit, my friend dying right before the race, fucking, oh, and then him, my brother fucking, in, you know, in a coma when I went to do Kona the first time, and, and then, like, you know, thinking of all that and, and what was done to us has been a part of uh, my brother's addiction problems right. that he can't face. And then, you know, he just asked his question and I lost my shit on the podcast. I was like sobbing for like, fifth, you know, 10 minutes and I couldn't talk. You know, it was fucked up. Mm. But um, a lot of people heard that and were like, yo... Including uh, Tony, um, what is his name? Chris, Chris the Iron, the Iron, the uh, Iron Chris Man. Chris Lieto. No, O'Donnell. Chris. Uh, oh, Tim O'Donnell. Tim O'Donnell. Uh huh. He, he saw me um, when I, when uh, I went um, to the Iron Man Foundation thing where they showed the thing in New York. He's like, right. bro, that was like one of the most fucking cr intense moments. Like, but. It's not acting. It's yeah. It's still raw. And, and when brother, I see what my brother now, my brother's been clean for forty days now. Oh wow, that's new. He got his thirty day coins. Yeah, pretty good. So um, you know, there's a lot of people out there who was helped by the evolution of a Cro Magna and wrote, write me, and I think that this is the next phase in that because we all go through shit. And I said, even if this book saves one human life how can we put a value on that then every fucking minute of everything i spent on that book is worth it but i think it's going to help a lot more people because there's serious life lessons to be learned there and how we deal with trauma and how we push past and how it's not just about success and making it and fucking becoming like all of that bullshit don't matter to me it it, it, it that's not what this book is talking about is is talking about how do we heal the hurt how do we push past obstacles in our life how do we push past fear you know and even talking with you and and, and all the other people it's like i ask those questions all the time because i'm trying to learn i'm still trying to learn and I said, even when I asked you questions and I wrote about it in a book, like, you know, how do we keep growing? And you said, face something you fear all the time. Do something that challenges you. Face your fears. Remember when you yeah, gave... Yeah, I didn't make that up, by the way. No, I know. <laughs> but I'm saying you yeah. delivered the message just like you were the mailman. You you delivered that message, and that's what I'm doing here. And the little lightning bolt there... That's an that's a nod to the Bad Brains. Oh, it is. I didn't yeah, know Yeah, because that. their first album it was the lightning bolt coming down, right. striking the yeah, Capitol. Cool. So it's uh, well, you know. what I what I what I like about that is is that it's getting at the root of how you of how you grow and how you evolve into the best version of yourself. You know, most books of this ilk of this genre, it's like how to make a million dollars, how to like network or shit like that. It's like they're missing the big picture. It's like you can go out and set a goal and I can tell you how to achieve that goal. But if you want to know if your goal is the right goal for you, you better start investing in yourself in the real hard work that is internally focused in order for you to answer that for yourself. And that's not as sexy. That's that's the the messy kind of ephemeral, you know, process that I think is fundamentally required if you want to create the best foundation for 
living the life that you know that is you know that is that sort of like accessing your best blueprint for yourself but it's hard to talk about that stuff yeah. and it comes in all different shapes and forms depending upon your spiritual perspective and and you know what you believe and don't believe um, but i think you did a really beautiful job of like uh exploring that in a way that that is very inviting and, like I said earlier, like accessible to everybody. Yeah, thank you. I mean, coming from you, that that uh, it means a lot, and that's what I tried to um, do in this book. There's something for everybody, um, you know, from the hardcore people to the you know whoever. Like, uh, make it accessible, man, and. Um, just relate my journey and uh, help people who might be going through, you know, similar stuff. I told the guys in the program every that I'm working in the documentary, Dirty to Life, I said, every one of you guys are getting a copy of this book. And it's amazing, like, how smart those guys are. They have degrees and they, you, they wouldn't be in Amity Foundation unless they were exemplary prisoners mm -hmm. because that's who gets in there and they did work they got degrees and this guy was reading me the stuff not the musician another guy wants to do a book and he was reading me this his level of fucking awareness you you don't understand when you're sitting in a cell for fucking 20 years and you can't run from yourself you have to face that like i i had to do the same thing and everyone does everyone has to face themselves life is going to throw something at you no matter who you are that's that, how the book and, and if you can look at that like an opportunity well that's how the book came about everyone was i had evolution of a crow magnon and everybody was patting me on the back and saying what a great and i thought i had everything figured out and solved and life threw me that fucking 80 mile an hour curveball and said yo not so fast not so fast homie slow down you got a ways to go and that's how I look at it now. I don't try to ever see an end to the journey. I'm just, you know, okay, this set of circumstances came up today. I'm not going to project ahead or worry about it. I'm going to fucking, I'm alive today. Like my friend that died, um, Kevin McQuaid, he got, you know, he did time in prison. He was an addict, everything. And he told me, and I wrote about it in a book, that any day above ground, Johnny, that's a good fucking day. Hmm. And, you know, if I could, I dedicated a whole thing to him in, in the book because, like, it just shows, even with him, how fragile life really is and, and the stuff, you know, we take for granted. One of the things I said was, imagine someone who had a near-death experience the next day, how she's going to look at life. She's going to watch the birds scrambling on the sidewalk for crumbs she's going to smell the flowers she's going to notice the breeze blowing through the leaves you get a whole different awareness of life by going through things and i think that's a lot of the message that the book takes away is um you can take away from the book is like there's a lot to be learned in those experiences when we learn to see it that way. Like what I thought was a curse, and you know, now I look at it. It's 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 all about perspective and vision of of how we see. Are we going to play the victim? And I played the victim. I'm guilty of it. I played the victim. I had all this shit done to me. I fucking here's the reason why I'm. And fucked nobody up. would begrudge you for playing. And the victim. yeah, of course they'd be like, "Well, he had it rough, but yeah. fuck that. That wasn't going to be my story. I didn't let that be my story. I wanted, I wanted a different story. I wanted a different path." And that's why I keep fighting every single day, and I keep reaching out to people because that's part of my service. That's bhakti yoga means devotion to, to devotion to Krishna, devotion to others, helping others. It's what the path is all about. It's not about. It's about all of us getting somewhere. I like to look at it as a spiritual party. Who wants to party by themselves, man? I want to fucking. Bring all my friends and everything, man, and, and 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 just keep doing big shit, which is helping somebody else 
get out of the fucking, you know, and I, and, and that was another quote. They say, oh, when you hit rock bottom. I said, no, you could go below the fucking rocks to the maggots. There's always a lower. There's always yeah, fucking, always don't think you hit that. rock bottom. You could always go fucking lower. And by the way, you don't have to hit rock bottom, and everybody's bottom is different, and we all have different pain thresholds. You know, yeah. if you're suffering and that elevator is going down, it doesn't have to hit the, the ground floor. Yeah. Like you can step off. So to kind of round this out and, and, and you know, bring it home, um, you know, if someone's listening who's suffering uh, and they're listening, they're, they're hearing your story and they're like, man, that guy, like, I can't believe how far he's come from where he was to where he is today. But obviously he's just, you know, he's a genetic freak or he's wired differently, like, I, you know, I just can't, I can't get out of my own way and I'm stuck and I, I just, I hear what he's saying, but like, he doesn't understand my life. Like, how do you respond to that? I'm one word, man, honesty. And I think that's, we have to be honest with ourselves. And I tell people that all the time. I have not, like when people write me, oh, you did all these races and you've done all this shit in the crow bags. And I say, man... You could do the same fucking thing. But the first thing that it requires is honesty with ourselves. We have to be, charity starts at home. We have to be honest with ourselves enough to say, and I had to do it, and I'm speaking from my, I had to say, I'm fucked up. I'm an addict. I'm uh, a person who has admittedly done grimy shit to people that have transgressed and done shit against me, which I felt, okay, now I got the right motherfucker to, you got what's coming to you. So it took a lot of honesty on my part to be willing to take that mirror that I'm holding up to everybody else and, 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 and looking at everybody else and flip that shit around and be like, I'm the one that needs to get fixed. Right. How do I well, do you're that? You're the common denominator in all the fucked up shit in your life. Yeah. I mean, but that's a big fucking challenge to accept. And I have a chapter called Accept. You have to accept the blame. Mm -hmm. Don't keep trying to fucking, you know, use events in your life as a scapegoat for being a fucked up person or you know everything's everybody's life is different but we can all attain the same things if if that honesty is there and that's one of the 26 qualities of a devotee is that they're honest you know it's tough you it's know, it's that's the, the hard, fucking it's hardest, the hardest thing, thing man. Yeah. Listen, man, you may look as where I came from and where I'm now, but what you don't see is the 37 fucking years of of tears and pain and fucking bloodshed and 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 fucking tests that have come that I failed and failed and failed again, but was willing to get the fuck back up. And it's not how many times we get knocked on our ass; it's how many times we're willing to fucking pick ourselves up and push fucking through the next gap between expectation and result and then the world throws us through another fucking curveball puts us at risk that's story in a nutshell so it comes down to what you want your story to be i didn't want my story to be oh yeah he was abused and he was abandoned and he was fucking made to feel like shit and it's okay that he's in prison or fucking dead that was it's understandable fuck that i didn't want that to be my story and that's what i'm trying to tell people with this book don't let those events that have happened uh, in your life determine who you are as a character. You can break free of any of that adversity. And it just takes, like you, like you said, flip the mirror, man. Mm -hmm. Look at yourself. Stop looking at everybody else and what they're doing. That don't matter. What anybody else does don't matter. You know, it's, it's about what's going on with us. That's what we have the power to fix is us. We don't have the power to determine how people are going to treat us or look about us or talk about us. And especially with social media these days, everybody goes on there talking shit about other people. It's so toxic, coming back to the Joe Rogan thing. It's so toxic and so poisonous and so disgusting. You could have the best intention in the world 
and you'll still pe- see fucking people on your videos on YouTube, <laughs> thumbs down, <laughs> fuck this guy, fucking fuck him, fuck you. It's such a weird thing because I can't imagine, even if I had a negative response to somebody's piece of content, to like go and like, you know, Take the Let them time. know where I'm coming for, like, like, like dude, dress does your them life, down. That's, like, I, like, I, w- I just like, wouldn't do that. Does your life really suck that fucking much that you took all that time to go and fucking go on that shit and watch it and then be with with a poisonous fucking comment? Like, that, you know, the Four Agreements talks about that. Not to take things personal. That's their poison. That's their hell. And when I saw Don Miguel uh, speak, you know, even I still read his book and re- read those things yeah, because that's what thing, I fucking right? yeah. I do take shit personal. I'm like, I'm gonna come fucking bash you and you. Yeah, I've still that sent is, those emails. No, that's like I'm like motherfucker. Is a, I'm playing in your town <laughs> yeah, in a dude. fucking month. I put you on the guest list. Play the show. If you ever want to wind up and blood beat clot, your motherfucking like, ass. say something personal because that is your your Achilles heel, dude. Like that's the character defect that will like set you off and get you to do something you're gonna regret, bro. Yes, I know. And yeah. I, you know, I gotta. <laughs> and catch we all myself. got them, dude. I got dude, plenty of them. They, you know. But, all right, man. We hey, gotta end this thing. God bless, all right, man. man. Shit. I hey, this one. Did we record? It, let Check me make it. Sure. Yeah, dude, two and a half hours. Awesome. I love you, I Rich. Love you, Thank you for the forward. The book's called um, The PMA Effect. The PMA Effect. It's for it's up for pre when is pre-order the, link pre-order is up now, now on, it's on Amazon, Amazon and on the and what is the, the website? PMA Effect.com. The PMA Effect.com. Yeah. And you know, f- and you got you're get you're doing signed books for a minute here. Five hundred of the first copies. It's signed, oh, and, then, and, then, uh, and then and then and then. Hey, what's we the, got four hundred. What's the release already. date? What's what day? October second, is- the day okay. before my fifty sixth birthday. Right on. Um, so why uh, did I not know your birthday is in October? I'm in October Because you're too. you're you're I'm the twentieth, and you're in Julie's what? Julie's July. Oh, July. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, positive. all right. PMA effect. PMA effect. Thirty for life. We don't know what's happening. Thirty with to that life. Yet. Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, isn't dude, you said What'd thirty for life. Thirty. Oh, thirty to life. 30 Maybe to I did. Life. Yeah, I don't know. We're not sure. It's where, coming out where, next year. Yeah, we don't. We don't know. It's going to be but, epic. Uh, that's all I can good. say. Right on, dude. All right. All right, man. Let's Peace. go uh, get something to eat. Brother. Are we doing that? Let's yeah, do it, baby. That. Peace. What are we doing? Are we Peace and plans. Hands? We're we shaking like... hands. Love yeah. you, man. Take us out with and a mantra. Thank, thank you for helping everybody. And thank you, uh, here's here's my ma- here's my mantra. Tesham satata yuktanam, but the pajatam priti povakam. The dami buddhi yogam tam yena mamu piyantite. That's from the Bhagavad Gita. There's mean? nutshell verses of the Bhagavad Gita, the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. And that means those who are constantly devoted to the path, I give them the understanding by which they can come to the Supreme. In other words, it's action. Take action. Better yourself every day. Don't just keep talking. Zip it. There's a chapter in my book called Yo, Zip It. And that's what it's about. Take action, man. And push through every single day that's what it's about god bless everybody man yeah i'm not even gonna say peace and plants i just want that to be the capstone yes sir right on brother good talking to you